one thing about me, my sense of humor has always been a little offbeat. Some might even say it's downright macabre. I've been known to crack jokes about the most inopportune situations, much to everyone's chagrin. It was this very quirk that brought me to a place I never thought possible, in the heart of Yellowstone National Park where I work as a ranger. My name is Ezekiel Kowalski, and it was during my usual rounds that I first encountered an unusual series of events. While driving the patrol truck on a gravel path to complete my rounds, I came across an old camper parked strangely at the edge of a wooded area. Nothing too out of the ordinary, but there was something about its placement, as if it were deliberately trying to avoid attention. Curiosity peaked. I stopped and approached the camper. Just as I reached out to knock on the door, it creaked open. A disheveled man with unkempt hair stared at me with wide eyes. Who are you? He demanded, voice shaking. Ezekiel Kowalski, park ranger. I answered, my hand instinctively moving toward my sidearm. Is everything all right here? There's something in these woods, he whispered, his voice barely audible above the sounds nearby streams and leaves rustling in the breeze. What do you mean? I asked, peering into the dark forest. I swear it took him. He continued, wringing his hands anxiously. We were just out there collecting firewood, and, and suddenly something snatched him away. He motioned towards his fellow camper who had vanished without a trace. I pondered for a moment whether or not he was pulling my leg or genuinely terrified by something lurking within those trees. Either way, it was worth investigating, and truthfully, I've never been able to resist a good mystery. As we tread deeper into the woods, he shared his harrowing story with me. The man introduced himself as Alvin Chapman. He and his friend Richard Davies had been camping in the park for a few days. Earlier that morning, while going about their usual activities, something had snatched Richard from just a few feet away from Alvin. Didn't you hear him scream? Or anything? I asked as we continued on. All I heard was, was this horrifying screech, Alvin replied, shivering at the memory. Unlike anything I've ever heard before. He paused. And then he was gone. When we finally reached the spot where Richard had last been seen, I noticed what appeared to be deep gashes in the trees, along with a foul smell permeating the air. At that precise moment, an otherworldly sound rang out from a thicket nearby. My gut twisted and goosebumps rose on my skin as though something was watching us. We stood in utter silence, listening to our own pounding hearts. Maybe we should call for backup, Alvin whispered, sounding more fearful than before. No, I responded sternly. If there's someone or something out here causing harm, our best chance of catching it is by keeping a low profile. So we pressed onward, following any potential signs that might lead us toward Richard or this mysterious creature responsible for his disappearance. As we ventured further into the darkness, unease weighing heavily on my chest increased exponentially. Another loud cry echoed from out of nowhere and without warning, but this time it sounded closer, much closer. Alvin and I instinctively crouched down to conceal ourselves behind some foliage when suddenly, an inhuman figure slinked out from behind a nearby tree trunk. The abomination before us consisted of elongated limbs attached to a gaunt, emaciated body. It moved with a peculiar grace, emitting unnerving guttural noises as it prowled the area. I felt my sidearm against my hip, but hesitated. Would it even work on this thing? How had Richard been snatched away without a trace? Before we had the chance to consider our options further, the creature suddenly detected our presence. It abruptly ceased its movements and, with a terrifying screech, 
lunged straight towards us. In a split-second decision, I shouted at Alvin, Run! We took off, sprinting through the forest as fast as our legs would carry us. The beast followed with alarming speed, its gait spider-like and unnerving. As branches whipped my face and rocks threatened to trip me up, I realized that neither of us had our phones with us. We couldn't call for help even if we wanted to. We were utterly alone. Alvin suddenly tripped, sprawling face first onto the forest floor. I hesitated but couldn't leave him behind. Helping him up, I asked, Are you okay? I think so, he answered, wincing in pain. But we need to keep moving. The creature continued its chase, shrieking relentlessly as it closed the distance between us. I knew that we couldn't outrun it forever. We needed a plan. I spotted a small cave near our path and yelled at Alvin to follow me inside. My hope was that the creature might not fit or would have difficulty maneuvering in the confined space. Once inside, I hastily began searching for anything we could use as a weapon or distraction. All I could find was a pile of rocks and some sturdy sticks, so I armed myself just in case. Alvin looked at me with wide eyes filled with terror. What do we do now? he asked quietly. We wait, I said grimly, and pray it doesn't find us. As seconds turned into minutes, then hours, the creature seemed to lose interest and moved further away from our hiding spot. Eventually, all went quiet. We didn't dare leave, instead opting to remain within the perceived safety of the cave until daylight began to creep in. Finally deciding it was safe enough to venture out, Alvin and I emerged from our makeshift sanctuary. Fearing that the creature might still be lurking nearby, we cautiously picked our way through the forest, hoping to find our campsite and a means by which we could contact help. Upon reaching our camp, we discovered it had been ransacked. Our supplies were strewn about haphazardly, and our phones were nowhere to be found. In desperation, I remembered the emergency whistle I kept in my backpack. It was our only chance to signal for someone to hear us and offer aid. Blowing it three times, as was the universal distress signal, we hoped someone would come to our rescue. Thankfully, a park ranger appeared within an hour after hearing our whistle. We frantically told him our story but struggled to convey the sheer horror of what we'd experienced accurately. Let's focus on finding Richard for now the ranger said calmly while radioing for additional backup. We'll deal with whatever else is out there afterward. Though Alvin and I never encountered the creature again, Richard's fate was tragically confirmed when his broken body was discovered several days later in a remote area of the park. Even now, when I close my eyes at night, I can still see that grotesque figure stalking us through the forest and hear its spine-chilling cries. Alvin and I may have survived that nightmare, but it serves as a permanent reminder of just how small and vulnerable humans can be when faced with something so monstrous and unknown. And though we mourn Richard's loss and carry survivor's guilt upon our shoulders each day that follows, both Alvin and I have vowed never to remain silent about what happened to us in that forest. For if it can happen once— Who's to say it won't happen again, this time to someone less fortunate? I'm Bradley McCormick, and for the past six years, I've been a park ranger at Great Teton National Park in Wyoming. Sprawling over 310,000 acres, the park is home to pristine mountain ranges, lush forests, and crystal clear lakes that attract millions of visitors and nature enthusiasts each year. I always thought my career choice was relatively risk-free and low-key, 
perfect for someone like me who despises office cubicles and craves solitude with an unending passion. On one particular fateful evening while I was off work hours and touring the park area with my trusted binoculars hanging around my neck, as I loved birdwatching, which was something people would raise their eyebrows about considering that I looked more like a burly biker than a nature nerd, it finally happened. The incident that shook me to my core. I noticed Joe Halverson, one of our regular hiking enthusiasts processed past me with a bleeding wound on his shoulder. He seemed to be in immense pain as he struggled to get close enough to catch his breath. Between gasps, Joe managed to utter words that sent shivers down my spine. Something is out there, scratching me from the trees, almost couldn't get away. I tended to his bleeding shoulder the best I could but knew he needed immediate professional help. Offering to take him back to our makeshift medical station near the ranger cabin panic-stricken hikers began flooding in, each with a similar story of unexplainable assaults in different regions of the park. Before long, it became glaringly evident that something was preying upon our hikers something hostile and otherworldly. While our local sheriff's department urged us to maintain control of the situation and investigate ourselves initially ignoring law enforcement until further notice fear began gnawing at us rangers. As days progressed into weeks, the number of injured hikers grew alarming each sharing confusingly similar experiences. Their testimonies revolved around a mysterious attacker, a part human, part animal entity none had resolved from their foggy memories of being chased by a hulking beast. During another routine patrol of the park, I ventured along a winding trail one that straddled its new hotspot for hikers contracting deep lacerations. With my professional instincts tingling, I fixated on every obscure scuffling and the rustling that filled my surroundings. A glimpse caught an unmistakable hazy outline within the thick forest, and I stood frozen in place, perplexed at what looked like an unnervingly tall figure with elongated limbs which shrouded itself among the dense foliage. Suddenly the menacing figure charged at me releasing a guttural hiss like nails on a chalkboard echoing through the trees. My heart raced as I stumbled to find my footing fleeing for dear life desperate for any shelter. It wasn't long until my legs gave way under me from sheer exhaustion barely withstanding strength to stumble up to the very precipice of a small cabin hidden deep within Teton's imposing grounds. Simultaneously bounding through its entrance, slamming the flimsy barrier behind me barricading it shut with my foot as adrenaline pulsated from every fiber compelling me forward. Utterly speechless at what lurked just minutes behind, I glanced over my shoulder at an ominously rattling door handle attempting to keep whatever malevolent creature from plunging me into its darkness. I couldn't afford to waste a second contemplating our next move. I frantically flipped through my radio channels, seeking the assistance of my fellow rangers and desperately gasped into the receiver. Please help. I'm under attack by an unknown creature near Trail 7, close to the ranger cabin. Just as I ended my plea for help, the door behind me was nearly ripped off its hinges by the attacker. The monster appeared like no animal I had ever seen a grotesque mixture of human and beast with massive limbs covered in coarse black fur. Its face, if it could even be called that, was an array of sharp teeth protruding grotesquely from a malformed snout with sunken eye sockets glowering menacingly. Just as the monster reached out with one of its immense claws, an ear-splitting crack echoed through the trees. Tony, one of the rangers who patrolled nearby areas, had engaged the beast with his rifle at quite some distance judging by the impact. He yelled out to me from afar, Get away from there now! It's too dangerous! The monster screeched in pain and retracted into the woods as I took advantage of its brief agony and sprinted out of the cabin door. Tony met up with me shortly after. 
We urgently informed all hikers we could find about evacuating out of harm's way, citing a wild animal attack as cause. Soon enough, several more rangers joined Tony and me to converge over the problem at hand, something none of us faced ever before. Many ideas circulated regarding capturing or killing this monstrous being plaguing our park. However, with no knowledge about what it truly was or its origins, we collectively agreed that trying to engage it with firepower might be riskier than concocting a strategic plan. Instructed by local authorities not to involve outside help just yet for fear of inciting panic among residents and tourists, we instead compiled and analyzed accounts from hikers coupled with our observations to devise a carefully coordinated response. Suspecting that the creature might be drawn to the scent of blood, we arranged an artificial blood trail leading into a deep pit constructed hurriedly by our team. We masked ourselves upwind at a safe distance, guns at the ready, as we waited in our makeshift vantage point. A growl reverberated through the park air, alerting us to the creature's arrival. Sure enough, it followed our well-crafted trail with surprising ease, inching closer and closer to the pit. As it neared the edge, it seemed to sense something was awry, but it was too late. The ground beneath its heavy frame gave way, casting it headlong into our trap. As it writhed and struggled fruitlessly at the deep end of the pit, snarling angrily. Moments steadily turned into hours as the sounds of struggle began diminishing until they fell silent altogether. As we cautiously approached this captured monster, we observed its features more carefully under bright floodlights brought to illuminate the scene. Stinking and unnatural in appearance, it resembled no known being on earth though disturbingly sharing some twisted human resemblance. After conferring with authorities about our victory over this unknown aggressor, they dispatched special teams well-equipped for handling these situations with strict instructions for us not to disclose anything about the incident. The creature was swiftly removed from our park grounds and whisked away to a location unbeknownst to us. We rangers breathed a collective sigh of relief once this ordeal ended, although fully aware that life could never return to what it once was. As time went on and word never escaped about that dreadful beast or its gruesome attacks on our hikers, life slowly resumed in Teton National Park. Trails reopened, tourists returned, and memories of those harrowing experiences began fading from the foreground into an unsettling shared memory of everyone involved. We may never know what that beast was, but as a ranger, my duty remains to ensure the safety and protection of everyone who visits our park, whether from well-known hazards or unexplained horrors that we must silently accept as part of this unpredictable world. I still remember the day I told my friends about my growing interest in cryptozoology. They shared a round of good-natured laughter, ribbing me over dinner and drinks. Ethan nudged me with his elbow and jested. Man, are you serious? I bet you believed in Santa Claus until high school. We all laughed along, but deep down, I knew that I was on the verge of discovering something remarkable. A few months later, in October of 2018, I decided to take the plunge and booked a trip to a secluded national park in Montana. It had become an obsession, identifying mysterious creatures others dismissed as myths and legends. Arriving at my cabin rental inside the park, I couldn't help but feel excited about what was to come. On my first day in the park, I enjoyed a recreational hike along the trail near my cabin while chatting with a local park ranger named Ben who'd also taken an interest in cryptozoology. He told me stories he'd heard from other people encounters with strange creatures or unusual incidents in the park. 
We were just finishing up our conversation when we stumbled upon an eerie sight, flattened shrubs and small trees with their branches broken at odd angles. Whatever had caused this destruction had left deep indentations on the muddy ground as it moved through the forest. Ben scratched his head thoughtfully. I thought it might be the work of a bear, or maybe even a moose, he admitted. But these tracks don't match any animal I know of around here. Now our curiosity was piqued. We both decided to extend our hike and follow the unusual trail deeper into the woods. And that's when we heard it, an earth-shaking roar that echoed through the trees. In that moment, we couldn't come up with any logical explanation for what could possibly make such a noise. Ben muttered under his breath, Oh man, I think we're in for one heck of an encounter. Before we could react, the bushes on the other side of the trail rustled violently, and a massive creature burst out, landing right in front of us. What appeared before us had to be at least nine feet tall with an enormous frame that was both terrifying and awe-inspiring. Its huge body was covered in matted hair, reeking of wet rot and grime. But its face was what made me freeze in terror. It had a grotesque mix of ape-like and human features. Time seemed to stretch out until Ben found his voice and shouted, Run! Run like your life depends on it. It took a moment for my muscles to obey. We sprinted back down the trail, adrenaline pumping through our veins. The deafening roars of the monstrous being were suddenly interrupted by shrill cries of agony from behind us. That's when I realized that we weren't alone in our escape. Other people from the park were also running for their lives. Reaching a clearing, we discovered a horrific scene, a young couple who hadn't been as fortunate as us. He extended a shaking hand toward them but dropped it almost immediately upon realizing there was nothing he could do for them now. Their bodies were mutilated beyond recognition, crumpled beneath twisted tree boughs and macabre poses. Ben frantically radioed for help, his voice quivering. This is Ranger Alston. We have multiple casualties near Trailhead 6. Require immediate backup. Tears streaming down his face, he glanced at me. This wasn't just another story or legend. This was all too real. We continued running, occasionally tripping on rocks or exposed roots, gasping for breath. Fear gripped us as we frequently looked back to make sure the terrifying creature wasn't behind us. Eventually, we reached a ranger station. Other park visitors had also made their way there, all of them in panic and confusion. Ben immediately contacted the reinforcements he radioed earlier. Within an hour, a SWAT team arrived at our location along with several law enforcement officers. They quickly gathered information from all of us, reassuring everyone they would handle the situation. The SWAT team departed for the trailhead with their weapons ready. Though I wanted answers about the horrible creature that attacked us and ended those innocent lives, I also just wanted to forget it ever happened. We soon heard helicopters overhead as they began air surveillance of the area. While waiting at the ranger station, some park visitors shared stories of their narrow escapes from the large creature. A few hours later, the officers returned, leading a team that was transporting a massive net containing something unbelievably enormous and hairy within it. Though its movements were restricted, the monstrous beast still attempted to break free. Is that? Ben's voice trailed off as he stared at the creature in disbelief. The officer leading the team nodded grimly. It's what you described. This thing was responsible for those deaths. They quickly loaded it onto a heavily reinforced truck designed to transport such large creatures and prepared to leave. Before they pulled away, one officer approached Ben and me. We'll handle it from here, he said briefly. You guys did what you could out there. 
As we watched them drive away with that living nightmare in captivity, Ben exhaled, shaking his head slowly. I can't believe what just happened. My thoughts echoed his statement, but I couldn't bring myself to respond. I couldn't forget those who didn't survive this horrifying ordeal. Once everything settled down, the park closed temporarily to give everyone a chance to recover and to investigate the scene of the attacks. In memory of those who tragically didn't make it, a memorial was erected near the trailhead. The story of the large, hairy creature became public news, and though some still tried to classify it as folklore, those who survived knew the truth. I refused to visit the park afterward. Even with the creature detained, the memories came flooding back every time I thought about returning. The government never released any information about their findings or what they did with the creature. Speculation circulated, but no one had concrete answers. Though life has moved on for me and Ben, we will always remember that earth-shaking roar echoing through the trees and the innocent lives lost in their encounter with that terrifying creature. We never found out what it was or where it came from but we'll never forget our chilling encounter with it in those woods. A ringing phone woke me up from a deep sleep. I groggily reached for it, rubbing my eyes. Hello? My name is Calvin Milford, by the way. Calvin, this is Detective Barker. Can you come down to Larkspur Drive? Some disturbing news. Swinging out of bed, I quickly dressed and drove to the scene. A vibrant blue police tape greeted me, along with the faint scent of iron in the air. The area was unfamiliar, surrounded by thick woods. I never thought such a secluded place would exist near a bustling city. Detective Barker approached me, his face pale. He motioned for me to follow him into the woods. An eerie silence engulfed us as we delved deeper. Here's the thing, he whispered. A local hiker found something, unnatural. When we reached the clearing, I almost wretched at the sight before me. A torn, dismembered body, not one trace of clothing, lay in the center. What happened here? I choked out. Barker hesitated. We don't know yet, but we found something odd. He handed me a large cast made from what looked like an enormous footprint. That's massive, some kind of animal? I asked jokingly. Maybe? His uncanny reply perplexed me further. With more questions than answers, I began to visit Larkspur Drive regularly. The gruesome images plagued my thoughts while sleep eluded me. One evening as twilight descended and shadows danced through the trees, I caught movement from the corner of my eye, a bulky figure lurking. It disappeared almost immediately as if it sensed my gaze. Searching for evidence near where I had spotted the figure, an ungodly stench filled my nostrils, similar to rotting meat under a thin layer of dank earth and musky fur. Cold sweat broke on my brow and I felt my heartbeat throb in my ears. A growl echoed through the woods. Judging by the distance, it was uncomfortably close. Time slowed as I searched for the source of that haunting noise, knowing deep within me that I was about to enter hell itself. There, roughly twenty feet away, stood an enormous creature, large, hairy, and bipedal. The sheer size of it made my knees weak. It stared at me with menacingly glowing eyes, each breath a guttural exhale. Saliva slipped past its jagged teeth, dripping upon the forest floor in glistening beads. I knew I needed help but screaming felt like a bad idea, thought it would echo through the woods and reach the beasts before anyone could save me. I decided to stay quiet and observe. As if understanding, the hulking mass shifted with an unnatural grace, but never once did its eyes break connection with mine. They seemed as if they were trying to see into my soul. 
Its stench grew stronger as it drew closer. Wisps of disgusting fur rustled with each lumbering step. My hands slowly reached for something I could use as a weapon, anything to protect myself from this nightmare come alive. My fingers brushed against something cold and metallic. My trusty pocket knife. How about that time I tried to eat spaghetti without a spoon? I thought suddenly in a futile attempt to alleviate my fear. I couldn't fight this beast nor match its strength, and I knew nothing of folklore or legends to help me understand it. My only hope was to escape and call for help once I found a safe place. Gripping the pocket knife tightly, my focus remained on its glowing eyes as I stepped back, keeping a cautious distance. In what seemed like an attempt to corner me, the creature lunged toward a tree next to me, crashing into it with such force that the bark shattered. I seized this momentary distraction and bolted in the opposite direction. My breath came in gasps as I sprinted through the dark forest. Twigs snapped underfoot, branches lashed at my face, but pain was insignificant compared to what awaited if I stopped. Behind me, heavy footfalls followed, accompanied by guttural growls getting closer. I spotted a small clearing up ahead with a few cabins. It seemed like an abandoned campsite. Knowing there was no place to hide outside, I burst into one of the cabins and silently locked the door behind me. As I glanced around for a potential weapon or escape route, the growling stopped. Its absence filled me with dread as I wondered whether it decided to attack silently or had something worse planned for me. Regardless, now was my chance to call for help. Pulling out my phone with trembling hands, I dialed 911. An operator connected instantly. 911, what's your emergency? There's some kind of huge animal attacking me. Please send help. I'm at an old campsite in the woods. My voice was barely above a whisper in case the creature had drawn closer. We'll dispatch help immediately. Stay quiet and stay hidden until they arrive. The operator's voice was clear and reassuring. I thanked them and ended the call. Now all that was left was to hope that help would arrive in time. Minutes dripped by, feeling more like hours. Sweat clung to my forehead as my heart threatened to pound out of my chest. It remained eerily quiet outside. Suddenly, a gut-wrenching scream pierced the air, throwing me back into terror. Others, who might have been hiding from the creature too, had not been as lucky. Without warning, the door splintered with a deafening crash. The massive creature stormed in, saliva dripping from its teeth as it approached me. At this moment, I understood that all was lost, the pocket knife would be useless against it. But I had to try. With resolution surging through me, I lunged at the monstrous beast, but before I could make contact, the room filled with bright light and loud shots. People in law enforcement uniforms entered swiftly, rifles aiming at the creature. The sound of firing echoed in my ears as they focused their efforts on the terrifying stalker that pursued me. The beast howled in pain, writhing on the cabin floor before finally falling lifeless. Eyes wide and adrenaline still pumping through my veins, I gazed at the rescuers and whispered a thankful prayer under my breath. It was finally over. The officers escorted me out of the cabin and into safety. While we walked away from the scene in silence, I couldn't help but think about those unfortunate souls who did not survive this horrifying ordeal, their screams forever etched into my memory. Though I never found out what that beast was or where it came from, one thing remained certain. Sometimes we're confronted with situations we can't possibly understand or predict. I still carry that pocket knife to this day. A constant reminder to face fear head-on but knowing when to rely on others for help. I want to tell you about something that happened to me. It all began when my friend, Halston Carmichael, 
suggested we take a trip to Willow Springs, Illinois. I had nothing better to do, so I agreed. Upon arrival in Willow Springs, we headed straight for the infamous Archer Woods Cemetery. Halston had heard it was well known for paranormal activity and thought it would be fun to explore during our downtime. As he enthusiastically described its gruesome tales over dinner, I found myself chuckling at what sounded like folklore. After our meal at a local eatery, we got flashlights and decided to walk around Archer Woods despite my skepticism. Guided by the silvery moonlight and the occasional hooting of owls, we navigated through age-old headstones scattered across the overgrown grass. In time, we reached a clearing smothered in fog. Squinting through my flashlight's beam, I noticed what looked like fresh tracks leading further into the foggy abyss. As they grew more erratic and seemingly desperate, curiosity gripped us even tighter. We continued on our path until I spotted a discarded baseball cap nearby a tree covered in scratches and deep gouges. It dawned on me how real this was becoming when suddenly a blood-curdling scream echoed through the woods. Panicked, Halston and I started sprinting towards the source of the scream. In our haste, however, we failed to notice that we were heading deeper into the fog when out of nowhere, I tripped over something warm and wet. It turned out to be a dismembered arm lying amid gnawed flesh and bones, likely once belonging to whoever wore that baseball cap. Then we heard heavy breathing and felt eyes watching from the darkness nearby. Unfortunately for us both, Halston was unable to call for help as we realized we were miles from civilization and had forgotten our cell phones in his car back at the cemetery. Jokingly, I whispered to Halston, trying to lighten the mood. This is what we get for forgetting our phones in the car. Ha! Huh, he replied, clutching his flashlight for dear life. Classic us. Suddenly, a massive shadow emerged from the fog though we couldn't quite see its full form. When it finally stepped into the moonlight, our worst nightmares paled in comparison to this creature that stood before us. A hideous union of man and beast, its fur-covered body towered eight feet tall. Its long snout and razor-sharp teeth unmistakably resembled a wolf's, while its powerful arms and legs seemed disturbingly human. Fangs glistening with saliva, it lunged toward Halston who managed to narrowly avoid its snap but not without dropping his flashlight in panic. The creature roared ear-splittingly as it circled us in a predatory fashion. I tried not to think about how we'd end up like that poor soul whose remains were scattered across the forest floor. My mind raced as I realized we could neither outrun nor hide from this creature when suddenly another scream echoed through the night, one of agony and terror much akin to our own impending doom. But luck, it seemed, was on our side tonight, or so we thought, for the monstrous fiend darted off into the darkness as swiftly as it had appeared. Heart pounding, breath ragged, Halston and I gathered ourselves by unspoken agreement before embarking on our dangerous trek back to the car. As we retraced our steps through the fog-enshrouded haunting darkness of Archerwood Cemetery, adrenaline coursed through my veins at intervals. Every twig that snapped underfoot or wind that swept an errant branch came alive with perilous possibilities. With every footfall and passing heartbeat bringing me closer to supposed safety amidst this nightmare, anxiety built in my chest. Suddenly, a haunting howl echoed across the tree line, causing my body's fight-or-flight mode to falter halfway through as impending doom seemed certain. As Halston and I moved cautiously through the darkness, we kept glancing nervously at each other. We didn't dare to call for help, afraid the sound might attract the relentless creature back towards us. Instead, we focused on remembering the path we had taken earlier. Terror gripped us as we heard another scream echoing through the cemetery. That was followed by a blood-curdling snarl, raising goosebumps on my skin. We couldn't shake the feeling that at any moment, the nightmarish beast could burst out of the darkness and attack once more. Suddenly, through a break in the trees, 
I caught sight of our car up ahead. Relief washed over me as I realized we were almost free from this nightmare. Halston spotted the car as well and without a word, we broke into a desperate sprint towards safety. As we reached our vehicle and fumbled with our keys, a deafening howl reverberated behind us, stopping us in our tracks. The dogman emerged out of the shadows and advanced towards us with menacing determination. Its monstrous form loomed as a horrifying mix of man and canine, fangs dripped with blood from its latest victim. We scrambled frantically into our car, barely managing to lock the doors before it was upon us. The creature clawed menacingly at the windows, trying to rip them open to get at us inside. The savagery in its eyes left no doubt. It wanted to kill us just as it must have killed those hapless victims whose remnants lay scattered throughout Archerwood Cemetery. Deciding flight was our best option. I desperately started the ignition while Halston kept a shaky eye on the monstrous figure outside. With a roar of defiance, I slammed my foot down on the accelerator and careened down the narrow path away from certain death. Terrified but resolute not to give up without a fight, Halston grabbed my cell phone and dialed for help, explaining our situation in hurried gasps. Over the line, a dispatcher promised that assistance was on its way and urged us to continue driving. I pressed harder on the gas pedal, hoping to outrun the creature that had so violently pursued us. As we neared the edge of the cemetery, we saw flashing lights up ahead. Among them, we could make out uniformed figures carrying various weapons. The police had arrived in response to our call and were now preparing to confront the terrifying creature. I pulled over while Halston quickly informed the officers about what had transpired. When the officer heard our story, he gravely shared what they had uncovered about this seemingly unworldly beast. The local residents referred to it as a dogman an elusive and predatory creature of unknown origin. With renewed determination, a team of officers entered the woods, armed and ready to face whatever dangers lay ahead. We waited with bated breath as we watched them disappear into the darkness. Moments later, several gunshots rang out followed by deafening howls of agony. It was over in a matter of minutes. Exhausted and shaken by our narrow escape from certain death, Halston and I gave our thanks to those who risked their lives for us tonight. In that pitch-black cemetery where terror once held sway, we were left with little more than scattered remains as grim reminders of those less fortunate than ourselves. The memory of our encounter with the nightmarish creature known as the Dogman would haunt us for years to come but perhaps too would this flicker of hope that it would never attack again. With overwhelming relief that we had managed to survive this horrifying ordeal, we left Archerwood Cemetery behind us, a place tainted by darkness but also one where brave souls fought for their lives against an insidious evil and emerged victorious. I want to tell you about something that happened to me while I was in a small, but historically significant ghost town in the deep heart of Texas. My name is Cyrus Fremont, and at the time, I was conducting research for my new book on the mysterious unsolved murders of the past. One evening, as I walked along the deserted main street, I sensed an eerie silence only broken by the sound of my own footsteps on the gravel. A cold chill crawled up my spine as I came across an old abandoned well, its stones cracked and weathered with time. I struck up a jovial conversation with some locals at Miss Patty's Saloon, one of the only businesses still in operation. They joked about their imaginary girlfriends who lived in other towns and how they hoped they'd never meet each other. These conversations were light-hearted but always ended with whispers of that half-man half-canine creature rumored to roam these parts. The following night, when strolling through a grove of gnarled, twisting oak trees, I found something horrific. A mutilated corpse lay before me, 
its innards spread grotesquely all around in such precise and systematic manner it felt almost surgical. An overwhelming stench hung in the air as it seemed like every vulture within miles was feasting on this body. With a sudden rustling in the bushes, I snapped back to reality and began to panic. Clutching my revolver tightly, I cautiously crept away from the gruesome scene. The branches silently shifted above me as though they shared my discomfort. Having heard about the creature but never truly believing in its existence up until now, the image of what could have done this awful deed started coming together. Forced to accept that something was out there stalking this old town like a dark specter of legend, I began making my way back towards town. As night turned into day once more, my paranoia had begun to subside, and I allowed myself to laugh at a washed-out, road-closed, sign that faced backward in the middle of nowhere. If only my subconscious had truly been as playful. I returned to Miss Patty's saloon as per usual. But even with the taste of lukewarm whiskey on my tongue, something didn't feel right. A female patron spoke up, mentioning that her friend had ventured to the well last night but never returned in the end home. The room fell silent as my heart raced, their laughter replaced by quiet murmurs of worry and fear. Armed with a Macmillan rifle and accompanied by a local named Orva Voss, we set out to investigate the missing girl and whatever horror was lurking amongst these now unsafe streets. As we reached the site of the initial corpse discovery, I saw that grotesque figure from yesterday was gone. In its place were fresh tracks those same monstrous footprints I'd heard whispered tall tales of just days before. Orville and I looked at one another with grim understanding but kept moving forward into whatever fate would befall us. As we tracked deeper into town, our path took us past various abandoned buildings filled with rotting antique furniture that whispered memories of their former lives. It was at this point Orville pointed out what looked like an abandoned sawmill in the distance just coming into view, lit up by an unnatural green glow from within. Orville and I cautiously approached the abandoned sawmill, trying to make sense of the green glow emanating from inside. The closer we got, the more we could smell a putrid stench, as if death itself lingered in the air. We exchanged worried glances but continued forward. Upon entering the sawmill, we encountered an appalling sight. Blood and gore covered the walls and floor. Worst of all, Amidst this horrible scene lay the remains of the missing girl. Panic filled my chest. I needed to call for help immediately. Still, something in me wanted to know what was happening here, as if unearthing the truth would make some sense out of this unimaginable brutality. As we moved deeper into the sawmill, an eerie silence enveloped us. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps echoing behind us. We both froze in place as a horrifying creature lumbered into view. It was a bizarre mix between a man and canine, bipedal like a man with elongated limbs making it appear even larger and powerful muscles rippling beneath its dark fur. Barely able to contain our terror, Orville managed to whisper that he had heard stories from his grandfather about a creature called Dogman that stalked this area long ago. Orville insisted these tales were grounded in reality, not just folklore passed down through generations. It was clear we couldn't confront this monstrous being on our own. We couldn't waste any more time. We needed reinforcements immediately. It was decided that I would call for help while Orville kept watch from a safe distance. We knew our chances were slim considering how fast the dogman could move. The track showed it could cover incredible distances with ease, but we couldn't stand idly by any longer. As my trembling fingers dialed for assistance, I relayed essential information despite my overwhelming fear, our location at the sawmill and descriptions of what we'd found, including the appalling, terrifying creature. The operator expressed disbelief but promised to send help as soon as possible. I returned to Orville, who reported no sign of the dogman. Instead, 
There was a gnawing feeling in my gut that it might be watching us from a hidden vantage point, its yellow eyes glowing malevolent in the shadows. It could be circling us or even preparing to strike at any moment. The hours dragged on like an eternity as we waited for help to arrive, our only solace being the occasional crackle of static on the phone connection. Fear and adrenaline prevented sleep or rest. We remained poised for an attack that never arrived. Finally, as daylight broke through the darkness, assistance arrived at the sawmill in the form of law enforcement officers. At first skeptical, they witnessed the gruesome scene for themselves and were forced to accept the horrifying truth. A bittersweet relief washed over me knowing that others had witnessed this horrendous scene and I was no longer alone in my desperation for answers. Despite their training and experience, I could see that these professionals struggled with this monstrous reality before them. In short order, investigations were launched into both this incident and those responsible for creating or summoning the dogmen. Heavy hearts accompanied these efforts, mourning not just for the missing girl who'd suffered so mercilessly but also for our town's sudden brutality its innocence now stolen. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, life began to find a semblance of normality again. The haunting memories of that night at the sawmill still lingered. However, a collective effort by residents and law enforcement worked tirelessly to ensure our streets remained safe once more. However, even today, as I walk through our formerly peaceful town, my gaze drifts towards distant shadows where I can't help but wonder if those piercing yellow eyes are secretly watching us from their dark embrace waiting for their moment to strike again. I just finished my cup of lukewarm coffee, the last of what our rations allowed, when we got the call. Elijah Dane, this is a priority one situation at Delna Woods Park. The voice crackled through my radio. I quickly gathered my gear and headed to the rendezvous point. My team assembled as fast as lightning, Mykala, Bulldog, Ross, our demolitions expert, DeAndre, Blitz, Pomera, our sharpshooter, and Chante, Viper, Farnsworth, our medic. We were hastily briefed on a secret mission involving missing civilians and possible mutilated bodies in the park. As we entered Delmer Woods Park, I couldn't help but think about how surreal it was to find myself on a mission so close to home. The park was a beautiful mix of dense forest, winding trails, and the breathtaking Fox River. A place ideal for hiking and picnicking had transformed into our battleground. During our search, we stumbled upon a playground eerily quiet and abandoned. Gazing across the sea of thick trees nearby, Blitz joked nervously. Whoever designed this park must have hated kids. Look at all these creepy hiding spots for monsters. Little did he know how terrifyingly accurate his joke would become. Advancing deeper into the park, we discovered an old bunker previously used during World War II. It appeared abandoned but still remarkably intact. With caution, we descended beneath the earth into its cold concrete depths. We found evidence that someone or something had been living there scraps of human clothing and half-eaten pieces of unrecognizable meat littered the floor. My stomach churned as Viper inspected a particularly gruesome mess mere feet from where we stood. Just then, Bulldog spotted large claw marks etched into a nearby wall. Her eyes filled with fear and concern as she noted how fresh the marks were. The atmosphere in the damp, dark bunker had become heavy and suffocating. We could all sense a dangerous presence lurking nearby. As we continued down the dimly lit tunnel, we suddenly heard it. A guttural growl echoed through the confined space, sending shivers down my spine. Clutching my weapon tightly, I signaled for my team to brace themselves. And then it appeared, an enormous, monstrous creature barreling straight towards us. Its appearance defied understanding 
a hulking mass of fur and mangled flesh, with enormous tusks and claws capable of shredding human bones. Its eyes were wild, bloodshot, and filled with an unspeakable rage that chilled me to my core. The creature lunged at Blitz, its gaping maw filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. As he barely managed to avoid its onslaught, Viper took aim and fired her sidearm into its flank. The onslaught hadn't even slowed as Bulldog had tossed a small explosive device beneath the abomination causing it to stumble momentarily. Pure survival instincts kicked in, and we engaged this nightmare in relentless combat. With no time to think, we made a collective decision to run for our lives. We scrambled back through the dark tunnel, the monstrous creature's growls and ferocious roars just inches behind us. We didn't think about calling for help. Our focus was solely on getting as far away from this horrifying beast as possible. Blitz tripped and fell on a piece of debris, his body tumbling down onto the cold concrete. I reached out to help him up, but it was too late. The creature closed in on him, grasping his leg with its enormous claw. Blitz screamed in pain as his leg was crushed in an instant. Viper called out to him but continued running without turning back. We managed to reach the surface and scrambled up from the bunker entrance, Viper slamming the heavy steel door shut. We could hear the monster pounding against it from below as we caught our breaths. What are we supposed to do now? Bulldog asked nervously, her voice trembling. We need help, I replied, gripping my weapon tight. We have to get back to base and gather reinforcements. As we made our way back through the park, we kept an eye on our surroundings, remaining vigilant for any sign of movement or danger. Our thoughts were consumed by worry for blitz and questions about what exactly that monster was. Upon arriving at base, we immediately reported what had transpired in the bunker and demanded support. Our superiors were initially skeptical of our account but took quick action as they saw the terror in our eyes. A heavily armed team accompanied us back to the bunker, ready to face whatever lurked beneath its depths. The steel door now twisted and mangled from the beast's efforts. It appeared it had retreated for now. We reluctantly led them through each dark corridor with equal amounts of caution and dread building up within each step taken. The attack commenced as soon as we reached the spot where Blitz had fallen. The creature erupted from the shadows, slamming into one of the armed team members and tearing through them with ease. Flames from the squad's flamethrowers danced across its hide, enraging the beast as it continued its relentless assault. The battle raged on, filling the confined space with blood, gore, and the pained cries of our comrades. The creature's rage seemed endless and unmatched by anything we had ever come across before. After an intense struggle that felt like ours, Bulldog saw her chance. She hurled a grenade directly into the mouth of the creature as it attempted to lunge at her. The force of the explosion shook the bunker's foundation blowing a massive hole through the creature's skull and finally silencing its roars and growls. We stood in the now-quiet tunnel, surveying the grisly aftermath of our ordeal. We lost several more team members in addition to Blitz, gone forever in this gruesome display of sacrifice and overturn. When we debriefed our haunting experience, we were ordered to keep our findings confidential, permanently sealing all documents related to that night. Though it was hard to accept what we'd encountered and those we'd lost, we eventually continued on with our lives. The park was closed indefinitely for maintenance issues. Bulldozers came in to seal that bunker forevermore. As solid concrete took place over the entrance that had led us into hell and back, I couldn't help but remember each life claimed by that nightmare within those cold concrete walls. Blitz, crawler, duffel brave souls who stood tall until their end. It didn't matter whether people knew about them or not. They would always be heroes in my eyes. 
and although I knew sealing off that place would retract a tinge of justice for them all, deep down in my thoughts I couldn't help but question if there might be other horrors waiting just around the bend, that band-aids to seal off atrocities might not be enough. But only time would tell. It was the year 2015, and I decided to live off the grid, nestled in the backwoods of Kentucky. My name is Reggie Marlowe, and I wanted the peace and serenity that nature could offer. My life in the heart of nature gave me a sense of independence that city life had stolen from me. One morning, at the crack of dawn, I swung an axe at a tree to collect firewood for the oncoming winter. The wood chips flew around me as I heaved a sigh. It reminded me of a joke my grandfather once told me about lumberjacks, that they made sense with every swing. I chuckled at the thought. Days went by, consisting primarily of hunting, fishing, and keeping myself fit. That all changed when I encountered Carly Mannings. She was a strong-spirited woman who had also chosen life off the grid. We quickly became friends, exploring our surroundings together and teaching each other survival skills. One evening, as Carly and I cooked freshly caught fish over a fire pit, we heard an unfamiliar shriek, something between a wolf's howl and a woman's scream. We exchanged glances briefly but decided not to let it bother us. After all, nature is often full of surprises. The weeks passed by without incident until one day. While walking along a narrow path through dense woods, we stumbled upon something truly horrifying, a dismembered human leg. It looked like it had been brutally ripped from its socket sinewy flesh hung loosely around jagged bone fragments. Carly wretched as we stared in shock at this grisly discovery, completely unlike anything we had ever encountered before. We hastily covered the gruesome sight with leaves and branches while simultaneously trying to understand what could have caused such horrors. As dusk approached one day during our routine scouting for provisions, Carly and I decided to set up camp. The sky was dusky, and a light mist hovered around us, making it difficult to see anything clearly. It was then that we heard it a crunching sound, accompanied by heavy breathing. Our faces paled as we looked at each other, then slowly turned our heads towards the source of the noise. A large creature hunched over an unidentified mass, tearing at the flesh while blood dripped onto the forest floor. It was unlike anything either of us had ever seen before, resembling a nightmarish fusion of man and beast. Its muscular form was covered in dark matted fur, yet their limbs were clearly disproportioned. Its head was filled with hair and with piercing eyes that gleamed menacingly. With its razor-sharp claws, it continued to tear apart what we now identified as a human corpse, someone who must have crossed paths with this creature before we did. We dared not let out a sound but stood there, frozen in place from fear. We knew instinctively that if it saw or smelled us, we would be next on its menu. Thoughts raced through my mind. Could this be a cryptid or some rouge scientific experiment gone wrong? But all these thoughts were futile in that terrifying moment. Well, look what we have here. The beast spoke in a deep guttural tone, as though somehow sensing our presence. My heart plummeted towards my stomach as I clutched Carly's hand tightly. The slimy, elongated tongue of the creature licked its lips menacingly. It glanced around and sniffed the air before turning those horrifying eyes on us once more. Ready for the game? The gruesome monster snickered and began advancing toward us with slow, deliberate steps while never taking its eyes off ours. Attempting to escape the approaching horror, Carly and I stumbled back, looking for any path away from the creature. We couldn't call for help since we had left our phones back at camp, 
a decision we now deeply regretted. We spotted a narrow trail and followed it, hoping it would lead to safety. The creature continued to pursue us, its guttural growls filling the air as it closed the gap between us. Panicked, we ran deeper into the woods, stumbling through underbrush and over roots. Eventually, to our surprise, we found ourselves at a staircase made of stone within the forest. We hesitated momentarily, wondering how such a structure could exist in this remote area. It seemed ludicrous to try and climb it in order to escape the beast now stalking us. But as the creature neared us once more with terrible speed and intent, we had no other choice. As we ascended the stairs, I noticed they were slick with something dark. I tried not to think about what that substance might be or what it implied for our own safety. Reaching the top of the staircase, we found ourselves on a small plateau overlooking a vast expanse of treetops. We looked around desperately for any means of escape or some way to protect ourselves from the predatory monster following us closely behind. A sharp cracking noise echoed through the air as the first step of the staircase crumbled beneath the creature's weight. The monster hesitated, allowing us just enough time to try something desperate. We started pushing one of several large rocks scattered around the plateau towards the edge, the rock teetering on the precipice before plunging downward, crashing against more steps on its way down. The creature's snarl betrayed its frustration as it leaped aside to avoid being crushed by our makeshift weapon. It studied us from below as successive stair steps shattered under our bombardment, its path upwards becoming increasingly difficult. Eventually, through our combined efforts, enough of the steps had broken away to halt the creature's ascent. It growled in fury but couldn't reach us. It circled the base of the plateau, searching for an alternative route. We stayed vigilant, ready for its next move. As the day dragged on, the sun began to set, and still, the creature relentlessly paced below us. Carly noticed something in its behavior, a certain avoidance of direct sunlight. Perhaps there was a reason this monster hunted at night after all. It eventually retreated into the cover of darkness beyond our sight. Exhausted but alive, we huddled together atop that strange plateau until morning came again. As daylight broke through and shone upon us, we saw for the first time just how many staircases surrounded us in the clearing. Slowly and carefully, we climbed down one of the untouched staircases and cautiously made our way back to camp. Feeling incredibly lucky to be alive, we didn't dare stop until we reached civilization once more. Days later, after numerous discussions and a bit of online research on local myths and legends, careful not to delve into paranormal explanations, we discovered references to a cryptid known as Leatherin, a creature that was said to roam these particular woods for centuries. Whether what we faced that horrifying night was truly Leatherin or some other monstrous aberration, we'll likely never know for sure. The experience remains a chilling reminder of how close we came to becoming victims ourselves, their fates left behind on those mysterious staircases in the woods. I've always been a fan of hiking, exploring the untouched beauty of nature away from the noise and chaos of the city. This passion eventually led me to accept a job as a park ranger in a secluded reservation located deep in the forests of Oklahoma. The fascinating mix of forest, wildlife, and the rich Native American history that surrounded me every day were in my opinion phenomenal. My name is Iona Chenoa. I was assigned to patrol an area on the edge of the woods near an old burial ground that was rumored to be cursed. Working alongside a local Native American community felt like an excellent opportunity to share cultures and create mutual understanding between us. 
One evening, as I was patrolling near the burial site, I came across what appeared to be the remains of a grisly scene. There were bones scattered all over the ground, remnants of a meal consumed by some wild animal or an angry spirit. I refused to believe the supernatural rumors that circled within our community. What has happened here? This is not a usual sight. I mumbled as I examined the scene. A fellow ranger named Leotai, my closest friend at work, approached me with a terrified look in her eyes. Ayana! I saw something. I can't explain it. She stammered, trying to catch her breath. It had huge horns and thick fur. It wasn't like anything I've ever seen before. You must have startled a mountain goat or something. I replied calmly trying not to sense her panic. No! It attacked Masca. She said urgently pointing at another one of our co-workers lying on the muddy ground with deep gashes in his arms and legs. We need help. Leotai yelled, but we both knew this remote area provided little reception for our phones. Masca screamed in pain as we dragged him through the forest towards our headquarters. The ordeal felt infinite given our desperate attempt to escape whatever danger we thought lurked behind us. Our spines tingled in terror from an indescribable presence that seemed to be watching and stalking us. He can't go on much longer. I told Leotai as Masca's condition continued to worsen. Suddenly, an immense, dark figure lunged towards us, its face partially obscured by shadows. We cowered in fear, expecting our imminent demise. The menacing creature swiped its claws at Masca, the air thick with its malicious intent. My instincts took over and I reached for the gun on my hip firing several rounds into the abomination. Our panic accelerated as the gunshots echoed through the forest, my frail attempts to protect ourselves seemingly futile against this beast of great power. I emptied my firearm into it, but each penetrating bullet seemed to fuel the monster's wrath further. Its eyes are bright red like hot coals, Leotai said in a horrified whisper. Keep moving! We gotta get out of here. We just need another mile or so until help arrives. I barked as we clung to our last bit of hope, ignoring the pain from our legs that pleaded for a rest. The creature followed us relentlessly as if taunting us with its presence. It would hide in one location unseen, then suddenly reappear from another direction. As darkness enveloped the forest further, New unseen horrors awaited us around every corner slowed by Masca's incapacitating injuries. The border of reservation approached closer and closer, but with every step forward the sinister creature advanced just behind us. As we continued our desperate escape, I spotted an old, abandoned cabin in the distance. Over there, I pointed, hoping it might offer us some refuge. The three of us hurriedly stumbled into the cabin and bolted the door. Masca's labored breathing echoed through the empty room as Leo Tai tried to comfort him. We're going to get you help soon, just hang on, she reassured Masca. I decided to make a final attempt to call for help on my phone. To my surprise and relief, it showed a single bar of signal. I quickly dialed emergency services, and the call connected. We need immediate assistance. I frantically explained our location and described the unrelenting creature stalking us. Help is on the way, the operator assured me. I hoped we could stay hidden long enough for help to arrive. Outside, we heard branches snapping and soft growling as the beast continued its pursuit. It was closing in on us. It knew we were there. Masca's once inaudible whimpering grew louder as the creature drew nearer. The monster finally unleashed a full-on assault on the cabin door with a deafening crash. 
Each subsequent blow to the door sent splinters flying across the room. We need something to fight back, I've said, scanning our surroundings for anything that might help. Leo Thai quickly pushed a dusty cabinet against the weakened door just as it threatened to give way any second. This won't hold forever. We need to act fast. Despite our best efforts to prevent it from entering by barricading windows and reinforcing weak spots with whatever we could find, the large creature finally managed to break in through a small opening near Maska's side. The beast wasted no time in lunging at him, sinking its teeth deep into his torso. Maska screamed in agony. As I looked closer at our attacker amidst the chaos, I realized it resembled a huge wolf, but with terrifyingly human features. Its muscle-bound arms and elongated snout bore signs of intelligence unlike any wild animal we knew. When help finally arrived, the sound of an approaching helicopter startled the wolf-like creature. It let out an ear-piercing howl before leaping out of the cabin and vanishing into the dense forest. A rescue team entered the cabin, and paramedics worked on Maska as they prepared to transport him to the nearest hospital. Leo Tai and I managed to hold ourselves together long enough to provide our statements to the authorities. Our descriptions of the creature seemed familiar to one officer who whispered something about a werewolf to his partner, but they quickly dismissed it as absurd. In the aftermath, Maska succumbed to his injuries despite everyone's best efforts. We mourned our fallen co-worker, feeling a mix of grief and guilt that we couldn't save him from such a gruesome fate in these unforgiving woods. Our encounter with the creature left us with more questions than answers. Was it truly a werewolf from existing folklore? Or was it something else entirely? And why did it torment us relentlessly? Regardless of what it was, the harrowing ordeal left an indelible mark on Leo Tai and me. The fear and haunting memories remained long after we had left the forest behind us undying reminders of our brush with death that terrible day. As a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service, I've always believed in being prepared for anything. My friends often mocked my obsession with survival gear, but I knew it would come in handy one day. What I couldn't have predicted was the horrifying encounter that awaited me on that fateful shift deep in the heart of Deschutes National Forest in Oregon. My day started like any other, with the usual banter and coffee-fueled laughter among my fellow officers down at the station. It wasn't long before we received a distress call from a group of campers who claimed they'd stumbled upon something unspeakably grotesque while hiking through the woods. As one of the most experienced officers at our location, it was my responsibility to respond and investigate. Venturing deeper into the lush forest, I came upon an unnaturally quiet clearing devoid of any signs of wildlife. An unusual and distinct stench filled the air, an indescribable mix of decay, sulfur, and burned hair. It piqued my curiosity and simultaneously made my stomach churn. The grim sight that awaited me would haunt me for the rest of my life. In the center of the clearing were grisly remnants, gnarled tree trunks, torn clothing, blood-soaked earth, and body parts? Trying to maintain composure despite my mounting unease, I snapped photos to document everything before contacting my superiors to report my findings. As evening began casting eerie shadows on this hellish scene, I heard frantic radio chatter from one of my colleagues gasping about an unholy monstrosity he'd encountered further up the trail. Intrigued but apprehensive, I sprinted in that direction with quickened breaths, armed only with a flashlight and pepper spray when normally relaxation prevailed during evening tasks. Rounding a bend in the trail, Sam, 
no stranger to danger himself, staggered towards me, his eyes wide and brimming with fear. Our exchange was brief but filled with palpable dread, as he stammered about how a creature straight from hell attacked him before lurching back into the dense trees. He swore it bore a twisted resemblance to an existing folklore creature, but unlike any he'd ever known. Without hesitating, we armed ourselves with our service rifles, knowing that whatever was lurking in the shadows of those woods would not succumb easily. As we pushed through the underbrush in pursuit of this enigma, a heart-stopping shriek echoed through the darkness, clearly recognizably inhuman and clearly terrifying. Instincts kicked in, adrenaline surged through me. A primal anger and determination rose within as we continued our hunt for this nameless beast. We tracked the creature through a winding network of gnarled roots, jagged rocks, and shadowy underbrush, all while trying to ignore the sense of dread radiating through us. Night deepened around us, growing darker with every step taken away from security's lantern glow or splits of campfire crackling from eons ago. All of a sudden, in a seemingly dormant grove, the air grew unnervingly still and deathly cold while remaining thick with that all-too-distinct stench. Then, silence unexpectedly shattered as branches snapped under footfalls not far off, accompanied by guttural snarls and an amalgam of threats materializing nearby. I mustered enough courage to peer into nerve-shaken woods beyond my flashlight's scope when I glimpsed it an otherworldly visage of pure nightmare-inducing terror. Its eyes glowed like embers from hell's fires as thick black drool arced down its maw filled with needle-like teeth. Hunched over on long, twisted legs it partially revealed predator-leaning muscles hiding beneath a hulking mass of matted fur and feathers. Intense heartbeats threatened to escape our chests while rifles were leveled without second thought. Before we could react, the creature lunged in what seemed to be an attack coordinated with perfection outside of its natural predatory hunger. Branches crashed and splintered as it closed in. I locked eyes with Sam, nodding at each other as we braced ourselves for what came next. The creature, driven by instinct or malice, hurtled towards us with astonishing speed. Gripping our rifles tightly, we synchronized our shots, aiming for the monster's eyes in hopes of slowing it down. Our bullets struck home, but the creature barely flinched. It kept barreling towards us. Sam and I looked to one another briefly before realizing we had no other choice but to retreat. As the creature drew closer, the woods around us seemed to close in, and the air grew heavier. We darted through the trees trying to maintain our distance while formulating a plan. Why don't we call for backup? Sam shouted as he stumbled over a fallen log. Who'd believe us? They'd think we're insane. I yelled back, struggling not to trip in the darkness. Sam nodded in agreement. We both knew that calling for help would provide little assistance in this situation. For now... We were on our own against this relentless foe. The creature remained close behind us, its growls and snarls echoed through the forest steadily approaching nearer. Knowing that outrunning it was unlikely, I scanned our surroundings for any means of escape. There! I pointed towards a rocky outcropping. Perhaps if we could climb high enough, the creature wouldn't be able to follow. We scrambled up the rocks as fast as possible, hoping desperately that our assumption was correct. Upon reaching a high ledge, we turned around and saw the beast skidding to a stop at the base of the outcrop. For a moment, it simply stared up at us with those hellfire eyes before tilting its head back and letting out a deafening scream, blood curdling beyond belief. Its legs scraped furiously against the rock face trying to access us but failing each time. That won't hold it for long, I said, trembling from the adrenaline rush. We need to find help, 
or we're never going to make it out of here alive. Sam hesitated for a moment before nodding in agreement. Using our knowledge of the terrain and maps, we found alternate routes, avoiding the dense foliage where the creatures seemed most at home. By the second day, exhaustion took its toll on us as we covered a vast distance through rocky cliffs and rivers that acted as natural barriers between us and the beast. It was on third day dusk that we saw it, a small ranger station with a young officer present. We stumbled inside, practically collapsing from fatigue. The officer rushed towards us, concerned by our disheveled appearances. What happened? He asked with genuine worry. Without hesitation, we told him everything, the creature, its pursuit of us, and how we narrowly escaped death on multiple occasions. Thankfully, he listened with growing concern instead of dismissing our story outright. I'll contact the higher-ups, he said while racing to his radio. Maybe they will know what to do. As he spoke into the device, Sam and I allowed ourselves a small sigh of relief for having made it this far. We had managed to escape an unimaginable horror in those woods but knew this was far from over. While awaiting reinforcements and backup from officials who could assess the situation properly and methodically eradicate any possibility of people encountering such terror again, Sam and I paid respect to those who may have been victims of the creature's malice before. As survivors of this nightmare-inducing ordeal, promising ourselves never to forget their sacrifices or allow others to brush off our warning lightly. As we departed from these ill-boding woods behind us towards our haven encircled by mortal men protecting each other from all vile creatures lurking in shadows, including ones that hunt ruthlessly behind last rays of setting sun all we could do was to be the steadfast warriors and protectors of our home fronts. But one thing haunted me. I knew there was a high probability that there were more of such creatures out there, ready to strike. The month was June, 2021, and I couldn't have expected my regular work shift to take such a drastically unsettling turn. As a police officer in Taos, New Mexico, I'd encountered my fair share of odd occurrences, but nothing could prepare me for what would transpire. It all began when I responded to a seemingly innocuous call from a local store owner at Los Rios Plaza. Mr. Ortega, who owned a quaint antique shop that catered mainly to tourists, had stumbled upon an eerie artifact concealed behind the false back of an old armoir. When I arrived at the store, Mr. Ortega eagerly led me to the bizarre object in question. What do you make of this? he asked, gesturing toward a small wooden box atop the dusty counter. Found it just this morning. Gives me the creeps. The box looked ancient and had intricate etchings across its surface. Most notably, however, was its unsettling contents. Pointed fingernails collected in neat stacks topped with what looked like dried blood. You know, Mr. Ortega. I quipped while examining the nails more closely. I always believed that people who collected stamps were a peculiar lot but this person takes it to an entirely different level. Mr. Ortega let out an uneasy laugh and scratched his head. Do you think these could be evidence or something? Should we report this to anyone else? While my first instinct was to brush it off as a macabre collector's item, when weighed against my duty as an officer of the law, I snapped a photo and told him I'd consult with some colleagues about any next steps. I continued my shift but couldn't shake the thought of that bizarre box. It occupied my mind for hours until something else unexpected occurred, an urgent call from dispatch about a break-in at one of our local galleries. Arriving at La Casona del Arroyo, I found shattered glass, broken sculptures, 
and mutilated paintings strewn across the floor. Most unusually a quick and gory pattern of smears decorated the walls. On closer inspection, the streaks appeared to be made of dried blood. It was during my analysis that I noticed a figure in the corner of the room. Their face concealed in the shadows, but their tattered and bloody clothing spoke volumes about their condition. I called out to them. This is Officer William Lacasse. Are you injured? Let me help you. There was no response, but as I approached, out stepped a man whose disfigured features seemed to make even gravity churn its stomach. Patches of hair missing from his scalp and an oddly exaggerated bone structure. Sharp, jagged nails dug deeply into his palms, causing a slow drip cascade of deep red blood. Suddenly, with alarming speed, he charged at me defying what I thought possible for an injured individual. His movements were odd and unpredictable. His limbs appeared disjointed as he rushed at me with ferocious intent. An overwhelming panic set in overcoming all parts of my being. Instinctually, I reached for my sidearm and discharged a shot hoping to slow the monstrous figure down. To my dismay, he hardly flinched or reacted other than what could be considered a twisted grin spread across his face. The chaotic cat-and-mouse pursuit continued throughout the gallery, as those vicious claws swiped desperately at me narrow misses leaving trails of shredded air within millimeters of my flesh. Drawing on every ounce of self-preservation stored within me, I strategized to trap this ghoul in a dead-end corridor behind a secure security gate so that we could all be rid of this nightmare once and for all. As I led the disfigured man towards the dead-end corridor, I kept looking for the security gate switch. My thoughts were focused on buying enough time to call for backup. The man remained eerily silent communicating only through his unsettling grin and frequent lunges in my direction. As we entered the corridor, I frantically located the switch and pressed it. The heavy security gate came down right between us with a crashing sound. He was now trapped, unable to reach me but continuously clawing at the metal gate. I rapidly reached for my radio to call for backup. Dispatch, this is Officer Lacasse. I need immediate backup at La Casona del Arroyo Gallery. There's an extremely dangerous individual inside with me. My voice was shaking as I shared my location and situation with Dispatch, assuming they could hear the terror that invaded my tone. Unknown, chilling dread crawled through me as he stared inexpressibly and continued scraping his grotesque nails against the gate. His breasts were uneven and ragged as his chest heaved unnaturally. Soon after my call, reinforcements arrived at the scene, led by my trusted colleague Officer Thompson. They had already been notified of the situation from my initial report to dispatch, but they weren't prepared for what they saw locked behind the security gate. Thompson managed to get himself together and approached me cautiously. What happened here? What's going on with this guy? He asked me in a low voice, not wanting to agitate our trapped opponent any further. I don't know, I admitted readily. I found him like this right after I arrived. He attacked me without any communication. Our primary concern now was how to subdue and apprehend the man securely without causing further harm or escalating the situation. We needed to come up with a quick plan while waiting for additional backup from specialized units. Taking advantage of having a capable team present, Thompson took charge. Let's approach him carefully. Use your tasers. Don't take any chances. We need to make sure he is safely immobilized for everyone's safety. We all nodded in agreement and positioned ourselves at a safe distance from the gate. Each of us took out our tasers and prepared to act all together. 
We decided that once the gate would be opened, we would fire at once and hope for the best. The plan had been set in motion. I stood watch while Thompson operated the security gate switch, the metal barrier slowly lifting to reveal the sickening figure behind it. As the gate opened completely, we fired simultaneously four tasers hitting the man with pinpoint precision. A guttural cry escaped from his lips as his body convulsed, collapsed, and finally became motionless on the ground. We moved quickly to restrain him securely before checking for any lethal injuries caused by our action. Thompson bent down to ensure the man was still breathing, though severely injured and unconscious. He was alive. The situation seemed resolved, yet none of us could really comprehend what had happened in La Casona del Arroyo Gallery. There were surely more answers to find but that would be taken care of later. Our priority had been dealing with an immediate threat, and thankfully we had succeeded in doing so together averting a complete tragedy. That day, while it was not how I imagined it would unfold when I put on my uniform ended with us subduing an unsettling opponent who had hurt many people and left a gallery full of horrors behind him. But as surreal as this may sound, our duty demanded us to be prepared for such events and act accordingly, protecting lives while seeking safety for ourselves. And despite what appeared to be an inconceivable hazard within that gallery, Officer Thompson and I chose to focus on those who survived, remembering each person affected, brushing against death, and walking away slightly more scarred but still whole. No matter how twisted or inexplicable the situation might become, we pushed through to overcome it as good officers pledged to do. That July in 1988, I made an offhand remark about trying to perfect a pancake flip for the annual county pancake flipping contest. It's a memory that stands out as one of my last joyful moments before everything went awry. My friends and I, Robert Lovell and Alex Stevenson, the three of us childhood friends, decided to take a break from our mundane lives and have an adventure. We rented an RV and headed towards Yellowstone National Park to soak in the beautiful wilderness, camping under the stars and enjoying nature at its finest. We made our way through the lush forests, bighorn mountains, and crystal-clear lakes that the park boasted. As we marveled at the untouched beauty of our surroundings, a strange sense of unease crept into my mind in subtle waves. Unable to shake off this increasing anxiety, I said nothing and continued with our journey. It was dusk when we arrived at our chosen campground situated near majestic waterfalls. Setting up camp in record time, we sat around a crackling campfire, roasting marshmallows and reminiscing about previous camping escapades. Giggling at amusing anecdotes, we brushed off any lingering discomfort in favor of good times. In hindsight, that would be a decision we'd come to regret. Midnight came quickly, and soon enough we settled into our RV for the night. The music from Alex's Walkman lulled us into peaceful slumber, or so it seemed. At some point in the dead of night, I was jolted awake by a deafening crash outside the RV. Panicked, I nudged Robert and Alex awake before we peeked through the window. There stood an intimidating figure standing just mere feet away from our parked vehicle, a tall man with unkempt hair and wild eyes staring right into our souls, his jaw clenched and sweat pouring down his face. His bruised knuckles were wrapped around a massive crowbar. Without exchanging words, we each knew that the man was nothing short of trouble. That feeling of unease I faced earlier had metastasized into sheer terror. Robert grabbed his baseball bat 
and my hands trembled as I clutched my trusty Swiss army knife, ready to protect ourselves. Alex held the car keys tightly, waiting for our cue to make a break for it. The man proceeded to circle our RV, scratching at the sides with the pointed end of his crowbar, creating an unbearable screech that sent chills down our spines. We could hear his raspy breathing as he inched closer and closer to our door. It sounded like he repeatedly whispered the word, Freedom. Finally, the door handle began to turn and creak under his forceful grasp. My heart threatened to beat out of my chest while Alex whispered, On three, we bolt. He counted in hushed tones, One, two. A quick decision. Three. Alex flung open the door just as the man had almost gained entry. Robert swung his baseball bat forcefully, catching the intruder off guard and knocking him back with a sickening thud. We sprang into action, lunging for the RV door together. Alex found the right key quickly and jammed it into the ignition, revving the engine to life while Robert and I kept our eyes on the man. The man's wild eyes locked onto us as he pushed himself up from the ground. He raised his crowbar once more but hesitated. It seemed as if he was contemplating his next move. Let's go, go, go. Now! I shouted. Alex slammed on the gas pedal, and we began to speed away from our aggressor. We could see in the rearview mirror as he dropped his crowbar in anger and began chasing after us. But the RV accelerated too fast for him to keep up. Within moments, he was left behind in a cloud of dust. Heart racing, my mind processed everything that had just happened. We hadn't wanted to call for help because we feared it would draw attention to us and escalate the situation. But now that we had managed to escape from whatever malicious intent this man had, it was time to reconsider our position. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911 as we continued driving away. 911, what is your emergency? came a calm voice on the other end of the line. We were just attacked at our campsite, I blurted out. A man tried to break into our RV with a crowbar. He looked dangerous and was threatening us. The operator quickly noted down our location details and instructed us to continue driving for safety reasons while they dispatched police officers to investigate. Meanwhile, I also provided her with a detailed description of the attacker. Tall frame, disheveled hair, sweat-drenched face with bruised knuckles, so they knew what they were looking for. The next few hours felt like a blur of adrenaline, confusion, and fear as we waited for an update from the police. The feeling of safety we had taken for granted while camping suddenly felt like a distant memory. We knew we couldn't go back to the campsite, not after what had just happened, so we parked our RV in a well-lit public parking lot several miles away and stayed there until the police contacted us. Eventually, we received an update. The police arrived at our abandoned campsite and found evidence of the attempted break-in as well as the discarded crowbar. Investigating further, they discovered a rundown shack nearby in which their primary suspect lived. He matched my description perfectly. It turned out that the man had been living off the grid for several years due to mental health issues and unaddressed anger management problems. Freedom, which he whispered repeatedly during the attack, was his way of reminding himself that he was no longer bound by society's rules or expectations. Following our distress call, they apprehended him swiftly without further incident. In the aftermath of this terrifying ordeal, our camping escapades took a backseat to regaining a sense of security and normalcy. By working together and making quick decisions to protect ourselves, 
we were not only able to escape from harm, but also bring an end to one man's reign of terror that lurked at the outskirts of civilization. As time went on and life continued, my trusty Swiss army knife now held more significance. It served as both a reminder of how vulnerable life can sometimes be and the ways in which teamwork, resourcefulness, and determination could help us pull through even the darkest moments. My name is Bartholomew Hastings, and I'm a taxidermist by trade. My affinity for the Appalachian Mountains peaked when I encountered an article about the breathtaking caves in the region, riddled with fascinating geology. Being an enthusiast of both nature's artistry and solitude, I decided to spend my vacation in July 2015 exploring those peaceful caves. I arrived at a cozy little rental cabin near Burnsville, North Carolina. The surrounding area was mostly unpopulated save for a few scattered homes, but that's exactly what I liked about it. My nearest neighbor was an eccentric old man named Finley Quinton who had lived in these mountains his entire life. One evening over dinner on the cabin's porch, Finley told me a joke. Why don't scientists trust atoms? They make up everything. Despite its simplicity, it lightened my mood after a day packed with cave exploration. Looking over the landscape with new appreciation, I felt grateful for the vividly green woodlands and impressive mountain ranges that surrounded us. Days went by as I ventured deeper into the caves nearby. With each one different from the last, by virtue of their unique formations and untamable wildness, it wasn't long before this passion consumed me. At one point, while spelunking alone in a narrow tunnel one afternoon, I slipped and gashed my leg on a sharp rock jutting from the floor. Though gruesome and painful to witness thereafter, my fascination was unwavering. On another occasion, while hiking back to my cabin after a tiring day spelunking through one of the most twisting and treacherous caves thus far, I sensed someone or something following me, not too close but never too far either. However paranoid my thoughts may have seemed to others, instinct told me to trust them. And so every once in a while, between admiring the exquisite beauty of nature around me, I would glance cautiously over my shoulder. But always to no avail. The weeks quickly morphed into months and my obsession intensified. To my surprise, though, my apprehensions did not dull. They only sharpened. On my hikes to each successive cave as the days pass, I continued feeling a pair of eyes watching me from the shadows, stalking yet remaining just out of sight. No matter how hard I tried to spot the eavesdropper or even confront them, their presence remained elusive. At one point I'd considered talking to Finley about this unsettling sensation, but my skepticism soon prevailed. A fateful evening arrived when these growing thoughts could no longer be suppressed. Hiking back from another adventure through yet another alluring cave, I couldn't shake off an uncanny urgency to return home, feeling that whatever hunted me drew nearer still. South close it felt at times like warm breath on my neck, chilling me to the bone. Then silence. Right before reaching the cabin, whispers erupted from the foliage nearby. My legs turned to jelly when I noticed a monstrous creature standing in the shadows between trees. Muscular build, twisted limbs adorned with sharp claws outstretched menacingly towards me using a dark viscous fluid its eyes a sinister shade of crimson punctuated by unyielding hunger. Unseen until now for it chose only this moment to unveil itself to me, the being that had haunted and tormented me in those seemingly endless weeks was horrifyingly real. And it seemed desperate for blood. 
overcome with dread at what was stalking me for so long and considering whether more lay hiding among the Appalachian wilderness seeking their next victim, and grasping that it, whatever kind of monstrous creature, or godforsaken abomination, it may be, had unimaginably sinister plans waiting for me should I remain any longer in its territory. Paralyzed by fear, I tried to back away, but it lunged towards me. In a split second, my survival instincts kicked in and I managed to dodge the creature's attack, narrowly escaping its deadly claws. I sprinted back to my cabin as fast as I could, glancing back periodically to ensure that the creature was not gaining on me. Once inside, I fumbled to lock the door and grabbed my phone off the countertop. My hands trembled as I dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? The operator answered. I quickly explained my situation, describing the grotesque creature that had stalked me for weeks and finally attacked. The operator assured me help was on its way and advised me to stay inside the cabin until it arrived. Despite the potential danger waiting outside, I knew I couldn't sit idly by. Other people might be at risk. Fearing for Finley's safety, I called him immediately. Finley! I gasped out between breaths. You have to get out of here. There's some kind of creature out there. It attacked me. What? Finley sounded bewildered and scared. Okay, okay, just stay in your cabin. I'll get out of here too. We hung up, both eager to make sure we were safe. As soon as Finley arrived at my cabin, we exchanged worried glances but said nothing. We listened intently for any sound of danger outside while waiting anxiously for the police. When they finally arrived, we felt relief wash over us momentarily. But that soon dissipated when it came time to share our story with skeptical eyes. We recounted every detail of the past month's stalking and tonight's frightening assault by the monstrous being. The officer listened with furrowed brows but ultimately told us there was little they could do without solid evidence. They promised to investigate and instructed us to call if we had any further issues. They departed, leaving Finley and me with the strange sense that our nightmare was far from over. That night, after discussing our options, we decided to pack up what little belongings we had and leave the Appalachian wilderness behind. We knew there was no use in trying to hunt down or confront the creature. It had proven unyielding, relentless, and terrifying. In our haste to leave the cabin for good the next morning, we welcomed the thought of moving far away. We hoped to regain a sense of normalcy and security. But as we pulled away from the cabin's gravel driveway, our eyes met briefly in acknowledgement that this memory would always linger in the darkest corners of our minds. The events that occurred in those woods remain unresolved even today. The police never found any solid evidence or tracks left by the creature that continuously eluded capture. After regrettably telling family and friends about our harrowing experience, their incredulous expressions led us to keep silent. In hindsight, leaving remains one of the best decisions we ever made. We chose to save ourselves and put an end to living in fear. While I know my life would never be the same after this traumatic event, I've started on a long road to recovery with Finley by my side. Both of us are determined to move forward while reflecting on all that happened including those less fortunate who may have crossed paths with that abominable creature lurking within the Appalachian wilderness. Through it all, I wish I could impart some wisdom or understanding about that horrifying being. Instead, all I'm left with is haunting questions. Perhaps some things are better left unknown and untamed within nature's hidden depths.
I was never a fan of wooded areas, especially after that strange encounter I had with birds. But when my friend Jerry invited me to go hunting, I couldn't refuse. I had been cooped up inside for far too long and needed an escape from the mundane monotony of city life. So, I reluctantly agreed to join Jerry at his cabin, which was perched on the outskirts of Appalachia National Scenic Trail in Maine. Although the trees loomed over us ominously as we walked through the forest, I couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder at the beauty of nature. It was so different from the concrete jungle I called home. The air was fresh and crisp, a welcome change from the polluted city atmosphere. My first time holding a rifle, I was shocked by its weight and power. Jerry laughed at my awkwardness and gave me some pointers. We spent the day taking turns practicing our aim against bottles set against fallen logs. As twilight approached, we decided to call it a day and head back to the cabin. As we trudged through the woods, our conversation trailed off. Fatigue had taken hold of us both. But just as we were about to turn in for the night, we heard a peculiar sound coming from deep within the woods. It sounded like a distant growl or howl. I couldn't quite place it. Jerry looked at me quizzically and asked if I'd ever heard anything like it before. Of course I hadn't. Could be some drunk hikers having a good time, he suggested. And although that seemed plausible, something about that sound left me inexplicably unnerved. The following morning, we discovered strange footprints outside our cabin, large paw prints with disturbingly human-like qualities about them. We couldn't figure out what kind of animal could have made such prints, but neither of us wanted to dwell on it too much. After a hearty breakfast, we set out on another hunting expedition. The morning passed uneventfully, and soon it was time to make our way back to the cabin. As we retraced our steps, we found the prince again, this time leading away from the cabin. Emboldened by curiosity and the knowledge that there were two of us and only one of whatever it was, we decided to follow the prince further into the woods. Jerry grabbed a flashlight since dusk had arrived, but he jokingly chided me for not having brought my own. As the daylight waned, the surrounding atmosphere grew thicker and colder. Something primal in me screamed at us to turn back, but little did I know that fate had other plans. The tracks led us deeper into the forest until we found ourselves surrounded by oppressive darkness. The sound of cracking branches startled us both as the figure emerged from behind a thicket, an enormous beast resembling a man amalgamated with a wolf. Its fur was matted with filth, its eyes glowing with an eerie yellow light as it bared its blood-stained fangs. Petrified, my mind was blank in sheer terror. I couldn't even fathom reaching for my rifle in defense. Jerry tried his best to fire a shot at the creature, but he struggled to keep his hands from shaking uncontrollably. The creature lunged at Jerry, knocking him to the ground and sinking its teeth into his arm. I knew this was our chance to escape, and I mustered the strength to grab Jerry's arm, pulling him up and away from the beast. We began running as fast as we could through the darkness, our lungs burning with each ragged breath. Why aren't we calling for help? Jerry shouted between gasps. No signal out here, I replied, remembering that we hadn't had phone service since entering the woods. Fortunately, the sounds of pursuit faded behind us but we didn't dare stop until we reached a small clearing where we spotted an old cabin. We immediately sought refuge inside, slamming the door and barricading it with whatever furniture we could find. Jerry, your arm, I said as I noticed the blood pouring from his wound. Blood was soaking his sleeve, and he was growing pale. I don't know what that thing was, but it's bad. He managed to say between strained breaths. We need to find help. By sheer luck, 
we noticed a radio resting on a dusty table in the cabin. As Jerry tended to his injury as best he could with a torn shirt, I powered up the radio and adjusted the frequency in desperation. A crackly voice came through. This is Ranger Station Delta. Do you copy? My heart leapt in my chest. Yes. We're in danger and need help. There's some kind of animal attacking us. My friend is injured. Acknowledged, came the response. Give us your location. I quickly described our surroundings, hoping it would be enough for them to locate us. The ranger promised they would send help immediately. Minutes stretched into hours as we waited anxiously for rescue to arrive. The wounded Jerry seemed weaker by the moment. He passed out multiple times only to jolt awake suddenly, gasping for air, a far cry from his formerly confident demeanor. Finally, we heard the welcome sound of approaching footsteps outside the cabin but remained cautious in case the beast had returned. A knock at the door confirmed it was human. This is Ranger Station Delta. Open up! With great relief, we let in the rescue team which began working to stabilize Jerry while another ranger led me outside. I glanced back at my injured friend, thinking of how close he had come to becoming another victim of that monstrous creature. The ranger team escorted us through the dark forest towards safety. It seemed like an eternity until we finally reached their station, where Jerry received proper medical attention and radio contact was made with local law enforcement. That night, I lay on a small cot in the ranger station, struggling to sleep. The harrowing events were difficult to process, and I took comfort knowing that Jerry would live. In the days that followed, we received news that search teams combing the woods had found no trace of our attacker just twisted tracks indicating its flight. We left as soon as we were able, leaving behind those all-consuming shadows and praying that whatever terror it was would never see the light of day again. As I gazed out of our car window on the way back home, I caught a fleeting glimpse of something watching us from within the tree's shadows. A shudder passed through me as I wondered if it still lurked there. But I pushed away that fear. It was time to move on and let our fallen friends face their final rest in peace. I'm Jake Muller, an aspiring writer who recently decided to move into a little cabin deep in the Colorado National Forest. I figured the solitude would help me focus on my craft and produce my most profound work yet. What a glorious, foolish idea that was. As an exercise in character development, I decided to join the local search and rescue team. During my first month, I spent most of my time learning about basic wilderness safety and memorizing topo maps. Much of it was repetitive, but it definitely made for some unique tales at our weekly team meetings over a beer. Then, the phone rang in the middle of our meeting one fateful evening. The caller was frantic. We needed all hands on deck. Someone was screaming for help from the woods nearby and the situation sounded grave. We raced toward the scene, our hearts pounding with equal parts fear and determination. We reached the location described by the panicky caller only to find a crumpled body lying motionlessly with limbs bent at unnatural angles. What happened here? I stammered as I crouched down next to the motionless figure. Haven't seen anything like this before, replied Sam, our veteran team member. But we need to get them out of here now. There could be no hesitation. We had to evacuate this person and get them medical attention immediately. We carefully loaded the barely recognizable human form onto a stretcher and hauled them back towards civilization as swiftly as possible. That night I couldn't sleep, replaying what Sam told us at debrief. 
It looked like something brutally attacked them without remorse. But what? There isn't a beast or human alive that could inflict such injuries. Weeks later, while hiking alone near my cabin, I stumbled upon a large mound of bones, certainly not left by any natural process or common predator. These remains reeked of malice and were horrendously twisted, sending a wave of nausea through me. An unsettling shiver washed over me. I knew I shouldn't have been there shouldn't have seen that sight. I needed to find answers. Who, or more importantly, what wrought such unspeakable destruction on another person? Thankfully, the search and rescue team was my only lifeline. Back at our next meeting, I relayed my findings to the rest of the crew. They listened with trepidation as I recounted the bone pile and how it linked to the horrifying incident weeks earlier. We formed a small party alongside law enforcement to investigate this terrifying scene further. As we made our way back into those cursed woods, none of us dared to speak a word. We knew full well how much danger lay before us. And then we saw it. A horrid beast responsible for these atrocities, part animal, part monster. It had jagged teeth like razors and its eyes were so deep and dark they could swallow your entire soul. The creature stood tall on muscular hind legs that bent like those of a grasshopper. Its long arms ended in razor-sharp claws that resembled meat hooks. As it perceived us, the miscreation unleashed a bone-chilling screech that felt like nails on chalkboard amplified tenfold down every street and alley in town. It retrained those pitch-black eyes on us as we exchanged horrified glances among one another. What have we done? All hell broke loose after that moment. Everyone scattered in different directions. I dashed away as fast as my legs would carry me, hastily gripping my sidearm for protection against this nightmarish enemy. I could hear my fellow search and rescue teammates calling for help through our walkie-talkies. Jake, it's coming after us. We need backup. But there was no assistance. None of us were equipped with anything remotely powerful enough to fend off this force of nature turned evil. I clumsily unholstered my gun, knowing deep down it was useless against a monster of such malevolence. With my heart pounding and leg shaking, I frantically tried to reach my team on the walkie-talkie. Anyone, please respond. We need help now. There was only radio silence in response to my desperate pleas. The monstrous creature continued its relentless pursuit, leaving a path of destruction behind it. One by one, my comrades fell victim to its merciless attacks. Sarah was the first. The creature mauled her with its fearsome claws then tossed her lifeless body aside as if she were a ragdoll. Next was Thompson, whose screams were cut off abruptly when the beast's powerful jaws clamped down on his head. I kept running, gasping for breath and hoping beyond hope that someone would answer my call for help. But there was no one left. Suddenly, I stumbled into a small clearing realizing too late that it was a dead end. The horrifying beast, hot on my heels, leapt into the opening with a triumphant roar. I trained my gun on the creature but couldn't make myself pull the trigger. Deep down I knew it wouldn't make a difference. Unexpectedly, out of nowhere, a police helicopter appeared overhead. The loud blades and blinding spotlight disoriented the creature momentarily providing me with a glimmer of hope. A voice from the helicopter's loudspeaker ordered me to step away from the monster, and instinctively I followed the command. The helicopter lowered a rope ladder towards me, and as I frantically climbed up it just as fast as I could, law enforcement officers opened fire on the beast from above. Bullets rained down on it but seemed to have little effect initially. However, after sustained rounds of gunfire, something miraculous happened. The monstrous animal started to weaken and eventually collapsed onto the forest floor. 
Once in safe hands of law enforcement officers aboard the helicopter and seeing several gunshots finally having an effect on this vicious creature below us, my exhausted body finally gave in, and I passed out. I awoke in the hospital days later, still disoriented but thankfully alive. I was debriefed by law enforcement officers and informed that after a thorough investigation, it was discovered the creature we had encountered was a critically mutated apex predator, an anomaly caused by illegal genetic experimentation in a nearby hidden laboratory. The details were gruesome and disturbing. This abomination was not meant for this world. But what haunted me most were my fallen comrades, Sarah, Thompson, and others whose only crime was being at the wrong place at the wrong time. They would never return to their families and loved ones. A heavy guilt weighed over me for surviving when they didn't. After leaving the hospital, I attended their funerals and paid my respects to their families. It wouldn't bring them back or erase the vivid memories of their gruesome deaths, but it was important to honor their bravery in the face of such unnatural horror. The laboratory responsible for creating the creature was shut down, and those involved faced severe punishment. While I had no intention of ever stepping foot in those cursed woods again, I swore to myself that I would continue my work as a search and rescue operative. My fallen teammates would always be a part of me, motivating me to help others and never forget both the rewards and tragedies experienced that fateful day we encountered that unspeakable beast. I sluggishly dragged myself to the break room, barely noticing the old stains on the linoleum tiles. My name is Frank Feinberg, a cop in Lewisburg, West Virginia. It was my typical midshift caffeine craving. Little did I know what was coming. In the corner of the break room, I spotted Artie Pergola, our precinct's forensic specialist. Hey Frank, did you hear? Another body turned up near Sugar Grove Station this morning. He whispered nervously. Artie was always cracking jokes, but not this time. No way, really? I questioned, trying to sound casual. Yeah, he said. Just like the other two. Skin missing around the face and hands. That's brutal. My attempts at humor felt hollow as shock spread through my gut. What's even weirder is that no one's reported any suspicious activity or people. Mulling over these peculiar circumstances, I walked back to my desk and began reviewing incident reports. A stray newspaper lay on my desk. Lately, whoever read this left papers all over the office. Ire welled up in me but waned as quickly as it began. There were more pressing matters at hand. The day went on as usual. A couple of minor thefts, bar brawls, and drunk drivers. But everything felt different after knowing someone out there mutilated our citizens. The next case led me to the Sugar Grove station site. Another victim. I had a knack for being in the right place at the wrong time. The lifeless figure lay sprawled across damp ground littered with leaves and pine needles. Pulling out my flashlight... I carefully examined surrounding trees for any potential evidence or clues. I discovered something unexpected. Tiny carvings on one tree's bark formed a half-circle around an eye that stared back at me coldly, an ominous symbol encapsulating grief from these murders. Minutes later, I gingerly turned a large rock over in search of more clues. To my surprise and slight disgust, Hidden underneath was a bloody knife caked with dirt and scabs of flesh. As I picked it up with gloved hands, a tingling sensation spread through my body. The very next instant felt surreal, feeling eyes fixed on my back like a loaded gun as spine-chilling whispers filled my ears. My heart raced, but when I turned around to confront this unseen figure, nothing was there. What's wrong, Frank? Artie appeared out of nowhere holding a specimen bag to collect the knife. Textbook example of a serial killer here. But no witnesses yet. 
Yeah, talk about a ghost, I replied. Though my tone was light-hearted, concerns brewed inside me about the mysterious presence that watched us from afar. During the following week at work, four more victims faced the grisly end near Sugar Grove Station. The entire precinct scrambled to uncover any connections between them. A serial killer in our town was unheard of. The whispering persisted, but only when I ventured outside or interacted with evidence. A veil separated me from whoever sent these eerie messages. One evening, after interviewing potential witnesses at a local dive bar near Sugar Grove Station, it suddenly dawned on me. I'd been given small hints all along hidden within those barely audible whispers. They contained information unavailable to anyone except for those familiar with the case. My suspicions were confirmed when I discovered two people accompanying the fifth victim before their murder, surprisingly unharmed and providing matching descriptions of their nameless rescuer. A bitter taste filled my mouth as thoughts swirled inside me. Could our mystery killer be responsible for saving lives too? Every time I found myself close to apprehending this person based on veil thin evidence, a shoe print or strand of hair, they would somehow evade capture and provide another clue for me to find. As this twisted game of cat and mouse continued, I began feeling a sick sense of kinship toward the unidentified individual who had crawled their way into my life. One fateful day, Alone in the forest near Sugar Grove Station as guidance from an unheard whisper urged me to investigate further, a figure emerged from behind a tree, cloaked in soiled garments with a burlap sack obscuring their face. All that was visible were two piercing blue eyes that seemed to embed themselves into my very soul. My heart raced. I had finally found him. I cautiously approached the figure, my instincts telling me to run. However, I needed answers. Who are you? I managed to ask nervously. The figure didn't respond, but those blue eyes continued to stare deeply into mine. I glanced around, trying to think of any reason this person might be after me and the other victims in town. I knew that if I tried to call for help, they might vanish before the police arrived. The only chance I had was to try and handle this situation myself. As I took a step closer, the figure suddenly lunged at me. I stumbled backward in shock and narrowly avoided being grabbed by their outstretched arms. The assailant's fingers were long and dirty, and their nails looked like they could easily pierce my skin. I needed an escape route, so without thinking, I dashed deeper into the dark forest, the adrenaline pumping through my body fueling every stride. My pursuer followed close behind silent yet menacingly fast. The dim evening light made it difficult to see where I was going, but as I ran, I suddenly spotted a park ranger vehicle in the distance. Relief washed over me, and with renewed vigor, I sprinted toward the vehicle. Aware that we were no longer alone in the forest, my mysterious attacker hesitated for a moment before retreating back into the darkness. Frantically approaching the park ranger's vehicle, I tried to catch my breath and explain what had just transpired. The ranger looked unsettled by my account while his partner radioed in for backup. The police arrived shortly after. Despite their support and presence, they couldn't locate any traces of the attacker nearby. When asked about potential suspects or reasons someone would target me and other victims in town, I recounted my investigation along with the whispering voices that had led me to this enigmatic figure, still unsure as to whether they were an ally or enemy. With the police now involved, additional precautions were taken in our town. The citizens, including myself, were warned to remain vigilant and alert. We couldn't shake the lingering feeling of being watched from the shadows. In the midst of this difficult time, our town banded together. We held memorials for the victims who had lost their lives and provided emotional support to one another. I constantly found myself looking out of windows and over my shoulder, my heart pounding at the slightest hint of a shadow or movement. The thought of those haunting blue eyes plagued me day and night. As weeks passed, the attacks ceased. 
no new victims were claimed, and what traces there were of our enigmatic attackers seemed to dissipate like smoke. However, we all remained on high alert whenever we went near Sugar Grove Station or ventured into the forest. Eventually, over time, life gradually returned to a new normal for the residents in our town, although we will forever carry with us the memory of this chilling ordeal. Looking back now, it's hard to say if the figure I encountered that fateful day near Sugar Grove Station acted as a guardian angel or malevolent force. Were they trying to save us, or was it merely for their own twisted amusement? One thing is certain. I will never forget those piercing blue eyes that stared at me so coldly from beneath that burlap sack. They are forever ingrained in my mind as a chilling reminder that darkness can hide within even the most peaceful of places. It was a typical Friday for me. I had just finished my shift at the local grocery store and headed home to the small, rustic cabin I rented in the woods for some peace and quiet. My name is Lysander, and I know it's not an ordinary name, but let me assure you, I'm just like everyone else. The early portion of that evening featured a serene ambience interrupted only by the crackling fire that warmed my humble abode. Lost in a new book and wrapped up in a cozy blanket, my worries seemed to melt away. It's strange how things can change so quickly. A knock on the door startled me, as I wasn't expecting any company. A frown briefly furrowed my brow as I opened the door to reveal my neighbor, Trenton, standing there. He was an interesting character a well-known forest ranger with copious amounts of peculiar knowledge about everything forest-related. Hey, Lysander, Trenton said hesitantly. I don't mean to bother you, man, but we've got ourselves a bit of an issue. What's going on? I asked cautiously while suppressing an annoyed sigh. Trenton explained that a criminal had escaped from a nearby prison transport earlier that day. The authorities were combing through the thick forest we both called home in search of him. As we spoke in hushed tones, our breath crystallized in the frosty air. Best to stay put until they catch the guy, him being dangerous and all, Trenton advised before he retreated back into darkness. My chest tightened in unease as I returned indoors and locked up for the night. Despite my fear that some escaped convict might jump out at any moment from behind a tree, life continued pretty normally for the next few hours, or so it seemed. While preparing some dinner in my modest kitchenette, I heard sounds echoing from outside. As the noises grew, I couldn't help but feel that something was off about them. They weren't the usual sounds a convict might make trying to evade authorities. Rather, these sounds were something else entirely. As if drawn to the cacophony, I nervously slipped out of my cabin's back door and into a moonlit forest clearing. The smell of damp earth filled my nostrils as I strained my ears to find the source of the disturbance. Disoriented and fearful, I found myself in an unfamiliar part of the woods with terrible smells wafting around me. A sense of foreboding washed over me as I stumbled upon what seemed like a small cave entrance obscured by vines and kudzu. With the help of a dim flashlight, I peered into the cave and could see unusual markings covering the walls. The eerie scenes depicted were unsettling at best. My pulse raced as my curiosity got the better of me, urging me further inside. A sickeningly sweet stench intensified as I ventured deeper until, finally, I discovered what was causing it, remains of human corpses strewn about haphazardly, their eyes wide open in terror. As panic gripped my chest, I let out an involuntary gasp that echoed throughout the cave. That's when I heard it, a creature so terrifying and beyond comprehension that my own mind struggled to make sense of it. 
The creature resembled a mix between an enormous wolf and a wretched hybrid of something otherworldly. Its muscular limbs ended in razor-sharp claws that sliced through flesh as though it were butter, while its vacant eyes appeared to possess an uncanny intelligence. It radiated menace, unlike anything I had ever seen before, making all notions of rationality crumble before its presence. The creature snarled viciously as blood dripped from its maw with every grotesque crunch on human bones. With one swift motion, it turned its harrowing gaze upon me, and everything in my being screamed for me to run away. Tears blurred my vision as fear prompted me to flee from the cave. As I scrambled through the underbrush, I realized what that horrendous monster was capable of reminding myself that I had to warn others. There had to be a reason Trenton didn't tell me about this thing. His knowledge of the forest was extensive, after all. Desperate to escape, I stumbled through the forest with my heart pounding in my ears. Somehow, I reached the edge of the woods and saw a highway nearby. Cars sped by, oblivious to the nightmare that was unfolding behind them. Shaking, I stepped out onto the road and waved my arms, hoping to flag someone down. To my relief, a truck screeched to a halt just a few feet away from me. A burly man jumped out of his truck and approached me cautiously. "'What's wrong?' he asked gruffly. With trembling hands, I explained what I had seen in the cave." The truck driver furrowed his brow but agreed to call the police as soon as we reached town. We climbed into his vehicle, and the truck roared back to life as we sped off towards safety. Upon arrival in town, the driver led me to the police station, where I retold my harrowing story once again. Though they seemed skeptical of such an abomination existing, they agreed to investigate once they saw the fear that gripped me while recounting my encounter. Days turned into weeks as I anxiously awaited news on their investigation. In that time, missing persons posters began popping up all over town. Faces of those who had ventured too close to the cave now etched in my mind forever. Finally, I received a call from one of the officers assigned to the case. He informed me that Trenton's lifeless body was discovered near the entrance of that wretched cave along with several other victims, all torn apart by what appeared to be an impossibly strong beast. My heart sank at the thought of Trenton being devoured by this merciless killer. Determined not to let more lives fall into its clutches, the police set up around-the-clock surveillance at the mouth of the cave. The initial plan was for them not to engage. However, unexpected events overruled their initial strategy. One fateful day, the creature emerged from its lair, enraged and bloodthirsty. The officers didn't stand a chance as it ripped through their ranks, leaving a trail of gruesome death in its wake. Backup was called in, but they, too, fell victim to this unstoppable slaughter. The town went into emergency mode. Barricades were set up on all roads leading to the forest, and a curfew was enforced. Residents were no longer allowed anywhere near the area as people lived in constant fear of the creature lurking in their midst. The government sent a specialized team of heavily armed soldiers with orders to hunt down and exterminate whatever was responsible for the devastation. Their efforts proved fruitless as they couldn't even reach the cave before perishing under this monster's crushing power, their bodies left mangled and stripped of any dignity in death. With no other options, our town's leaders had no choice but to ask for help from neighboring cities. The neighboring municipalities agreed to send aid but requested that the affected area be evacuated for everyone's safety. As the people of my town joined with others in refuge, we held each other close. Our hopes and prayers went out to those brave souls attempting to vanquish this living nightmare that had invaded our lives. In an unexpected turn of events, 
the combined forces from multiple cities finally brought this creature's reign of terror to an end before it could cause any more suffering. The mangled remnants of a once mighty beast were burned to prevent anyone else from ever coming across anything like it again. The authorities informed me that after studying the fragments, they could not determine what manner of life form that murderous abomination had been. It defied classification and left all who witnessed its brutal power awestruck and horrified. Years have passed since those terrifying events unfolded. However, those gruesome images will forever haunt the survivors who dare not speak of them. Though the creature that took Trenton was defeated, the wounds it left on our souls will fester for eternity. We mourn not only for those taken from us, but also for the innocence we relinquished in facing such unrelenting horror. I am an older, more hardened version of the person I once was. But even now, when I close my eyes at night, I can still sense the echo of its thunderous snarl, a chilling reminder of the beast that lurked within our darkest fears. It was the spring of 1996 when all hell broke loose in Eagle's Reach, an isolated and relatively unknown valley nestled in the heart of the Colorado Rockies. My name is Hank Matthews, and I'd moved there to escape the hustle and bustle of city life. The houses that dotted the landscape, like mine, were scattered unevenly as if dropped randomly from the sky. We embraced privacy with open arms, rarely visiting neighbors unless invited. My day began ordinarily enough, coffee brewing on the stove, bacon frying in the pan. I was finishing my breakfast when Alice, my dear 80-year-old neighbor from three miles down the road, called. Hank, she rasped through deep breaths. You better come over quick. There's something terrible happening here. Her voice quaking, she hung up just as abruptly without explaining further. I grabbed my coat and drove to Alice's house as fast as I dared on the muddy roads. When I arrived at her small cabin, I found her sitting on her front porch, trembling with a shotgun resting across her lap. Up on Grimes Hill, she stammered. Terrible noises, rain-red puddles. I've never seen anything like it. Forgetting decorum, I snagged the shotgun from her trembling hands and sprinted towards Grimes Hill. As I made my way through dense foliage carved only by a narrow deer trail, the air took on a strange thickness that slowed me down and toyed with my senses. The scent of copper hung heavily in the air. When I reached a clearing near Grimes Hill's peak, what lay before me was a scene ripped straight from a horror movie. Trees had been shattered like matchsticks, trunks splintered violently apart. A bizarre red foam coated the earth that seemed to be where Alice's so-called puddles had come from. There were no bodies, yet the scene reeked of violence. Secluded as we were, we had phones but no landlines. Satellite phones were our lifeline to the outside world but they weren't always reliable. Though fear coursed through me, I knew I needed to get back and call the sheriff, even though he lived nearly a hundred miles away. I was about to head back when I heard an unfamiliar sound a mix of a deafening roar and an anguished howl. I dropped to the ground as thick branches crashed around me like deadly rain. My heart raced, adrenaline surging through every vein. Through the mayhem, I caught sight of something massive hidden amidst shattered trees, an enormous creature on four legs covered in thick, matted fur. Its horrible eyes glowed red in stark contrast to the imposing darkness of its form. Its apparent fury was controlled by a sinister intelligence. It stalked out into the clearing with monstrous strides, tail whipping violently in its wake. Suddenly, it became aware of my presence and locked its infernal gaze onto mine. 
two predatory eyes boring into my very soul before unleashing another terrifying roar. Fumbling for the shotgun beside me became even more desperate as every ounce of my survival instinct screamed at me. You are prey. With trembling hands I found purchase on its cold metal and raised it to face the monstrosity bearing down on me. With the shotgun raised, I hesitated for a moment, uncertain if this was truly the creature's intent. Its colossal size overwhelmed any sense of reality, and I couldn't help but wonder if this was another hunter or just an innocent creature. I squeezed the trigger in a panicked reflex, my shot piercing the threatening silence. The report echoed throughout the woods as I watched in horror as the creature withheld its advance. In defiance, it seemed to grow even larger within the moonlit clearing. In desperation, I bolted towards a peculiar structure that I spotted in the corner of my eye alone staircase stood just a stone's throw away from our confrontation. My frantic sprint took on an almost dreamlike quality, and as I reached the foot of this perplexing sight, I began ascending without a second thought. The uneven steps groaned underfoot as I climbed, before suddenly realizing the absurdity of my situation. Why was there a staircase in the middle of nowhere? And why didn't it lead anywhere? The creature remained below, effortlessly tearing through tree trunks with its monstrous limbs, but not pursuing me further. While at the top of these stairs going nowhere, breathing heavy from both exertion and terror, Another blood-curdling sound echoed around me, a strange scream carrying through the night someone else was caught in this nightmare. With no clue how these ominous stairs kept me safe from harm or where they had come from, I realized that screaming must be coming from someone who wasn't as fortunate and they needed help. I raced down the stairs and towards their cries, my phone clenched tightly in hand. Finding my satellite signal still weak and unreliable, I pushed forward until I stumbled upon another horrified person attempting to radio someone on his own satellite phone. They had encountered an injured hiker further back who had received some gruesome wounds from their assailant. He had hurried to call for assistance when he could not get through on his own. The injured hiker, Sarah, had been mauled by the same mysterious creature that continued to haunt us. The two of them and I, strangers bound by fate and shared horror, worked together to devise a plan of escape from the monstrous threat that seemed to follow our every move. We rapidly headed for the direction of my vehicle, shifting between cautiously sneaking our way through the dark woods and sprinting for our lives when we suspected the creature was near. It didn't seem particularly interested in us at this point, as it remained infuriatingly idle after we managed to evade its initial attacks. Eventually, we reached my truck and drove as fast as possible towards the nearest town. There, we looped in local authorities who were understandably skeptical of our harrowing account. The investigating officers could not deny that Sarah had sustained severe injuries. In our attempt to make sense of everything that happened, we stumbled upon a local legend documented in a library dedicated to folklore the creature might be a cryptid known as Grendelon, a colossal beast known for its violent tendencies and dark fur, discovered years ago by those exploring deep into uncharted woods. Its appearance closely matched the horrifying figure we encountered that night. I felt a crushing weight on my shoulders knowing that Sarah wasn't so lucky as myself during her own encounter with Grendelon but tremendously grateful that all three of us had escaped relatively unscathed nonetheless. The harrowing events left me seeking solace in those perplexing staircases which remain an unsolved piece of the twisted puzzle what purpose did they serve? Without their bewildering protection, would I have survived? These questions lingered with me long after my harrowing experience, refusing to be sated or forgotten merely as something ineffable. They haunted me nearly as much as the very entity which forged them. I wished to never have answers. 
I needed not know any reality that threatened to expose something more sinister, more unimaginable. And as I no longer wandered into the wilderness, eschewing any ventures to the wooded outreaches alike, I attempted to reclaim normalcy and escape the dark thoughts that tore at my sanity. My shift had just started around 8 o'clock, and as I stepped out of my reliable 98 Ford Crown Victoria, the scent of stale coffee and donuts wafted through the crisp October air. Most people found it strange that a cop enjoyed what they did for a living, but I took pride in my work. Knowing that I could protect my community always felt like more than a job to me. My partner, Michaela Chambers, had the same mindset no-nonsense and ready for anything. That night, everything was unusually quiet at the precinct. It seemed like a good opportunity for Michaela and me to finally catch up on some paperwork that had been piling up. But no sooner had we settled into our squeaky chairs than the radio crackled to life, alerting us to a situation unfolding at the nearby meat processing plant in our small Indiana town. As we rushed out of the precinct, not knowing what awaited us, we shared an uneasy glance. Arriving on the scene, Michaela took charge. Johnson, you take the east side entrance. I'll take the west. With adrenaline surging through our veins, we split up and cautiously entered opposite ends of the sprawling complex. Alone in this massive facility filled with sharp blades and conveyor belts, anxiety played tricks on my mind. The low hum of machinery provided an uncomfortable soundtrack to this unusual call-out. I advanced further into the dimly lit space. Ahead of me stood rows upon rows of overturned crates and broken pallets, testimony to some sort of struggle. As I moved closer to inspect the area carefully, I spotted a puddle not oil or spilled soda but blood. The crimson pools spread across the cold concrete floor ominously. Without a second thought, I snatched the radio from my belt. Michaela, do you copy? We've got a situation here blood on the floor. Something awful's happened. We need backup. Trying to sound calm, I couldn't help my voice from betraying my growing unease. On it, Johnson, she replied her voice steady. But you should know, I just found something else. It's bad. My hand gripping the radio began to tremble as a shiver crawled up my spine, but curiosity got the better of me. What is it? There's a severed limb here, she whispered through gritted teeth. Get to me now. Her words sent a jolt through my entire body as I sprinted toward her location in the vast complex. Panic grew with each horrifying scenario playing out in my head, each more gruesome and violent than the last. I came across Michaela holding her pistol cautiously fixated on what lay before us, a dismembered arm with intricate tattoos snaking down its length. Both of us flinched as we heard an unnerving sound emanating from the darkness beyond our sight, like metal scraping against metal and echoing through the eerie silence. We stood back to back, our guns at the ready, realizing there was no time to wait for backup. Another noise made us both turn abruptly. A man-like figure emerged from behind the machinery. Though hunched over and wearing a blood-stained smock, it still towered above us. The cold fluorescent light overhead cast an eerie reflection on what looked like an improvised mask made of human skin. We opened fire, but he dodged the bullets with supernatural speed and lunged for Michaela with massive hands covered with metal-crafted claws that seemed to shimmer menacingly in the shadows. Suddenly aware of our imminent danger, everything erupted into utter chaos as we scrambled desperately to neutralize the threat before us. 
My heart pounded as Michaela and I fired our weapons simultaneously. The man-like figure agilely ducked and weaved, avoiding our bullets with ease. Michaela attempted to call for backup again, but all she received was an unsettling static on our radios. Somehow, we were cut off from the rest of our team, leaving us isolated and vulnerable. The figure lunged once more at Michaela with its metal claws extended, each slash leaving deep marks in the concrete walls. She rolled out of the way just in time, and I seized the opportunity to tackle the figure to the ground. It was stronger than anticipated, and it easily tossed me aside like a rag doll with a single forceful push. I knew we couldn't win this fight if it continued, and every passing second brought forth new questions about this terrifying opponent. We retreated down a nearby corridor, hoping to either lose or outsmart our nightmarish adversary. As we ran, I noticed the door slightly ajar what looked like an old storage room filled with old machinery and rusted pipes. Michaela caught my gaze and nodded in agreement. This place would be our best bet for now. As we barricaded ourselves in the small room, I could tell Michaela's mind was racing just as much as mine. We quickly devised a plan. Michaela would create a makeshift explosive device using materials strewn about while I kept watch at the door. It wasn't long before we heard footsteps growing closer. The man-like figure seemed to know exactly where we were hiding almost as if it could track our every move. With haste, Michaela finished assembling the crude explosive and handed it to me, murmuring instructions on how to activate it. As the door began to give under the crushing force of our pursuer's blows, I armed the makeshift explosive and silently prayed that this plan would work. The instant the figure broke through, I lobbed the explosive at its feet, and Michaela and I ducked behind a large storage cabinet just as it exploded. The force of the blast shook the room, and debris rained down upon us. Cautiously, we peered above the cabinet only to find the figure lying motionless on the ground. Its metallic claws were twisted and bent from the explosion, rendering them useless. We cautiously approached the motionless figure, our weapons aimed squarely at its head. It was only in this moment that I noticed several distinct scars and markings around its neck, as if someone had operated on it repeatedly. This creature had once been a man. Risking a quick search of his pockets, I found an old phone that seemed to still be working. I called for help one last time and was finally successful backup was en route. As security teams and backup arrived to secure the scene and collect evidence for further investigation, Michaela and I watched on with bittersweet relief. We couldn't help but wonder about the fate of those who had become this monstrous being's victims. What horrors had they gone through before finally succumbing to their grisly ends? Though we had managed to stop this monster from taking more lives, it was a hollow victory, for who could ever truly understand what tormented souls were injected into this seemingly ordinary man? The investigation would continue, but the chilling mystery surrounding this case would haunt me for years to come. It was April 2012, and I found myself alone at my uncle's remote cabin in the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. My name is Ben Thompson and I had agreed to keep an eye on the place while he traveled overseas for a few months. The first few days were uneventful as I settled into a peaceful routine of chopping firewood, hiking through the forest, and cooking squirrel stew. This tranquility didn't last long. In hindsight, I wish I never suggested helping out my uncle. One night, I started hearing soft rustling noises outside the cabin. 
At first, I dismissed them as tree branches swaying in the wind or perhaps some local wildlife. Yet, over time, these strange sounds grew more frequent and increasingly disturbing. Whispers that grew into deep guttural sounds echoing through the dark forest. My skepticism quickly faded as fear slowly interrupted my usual rational demeanor. To add to this peculiar situation, a few of my uncle's tools began to go missing. A shovel, flashlight, and even some sharp knives. I couldn't help but feel uneasy about the whole situation. However, one night the tension in the air intensified when I encountered something much worse than misplaced objects or unexplained noises. As I was walking back from setting up a deer camera deeper in the woods to monitor any suspicious activity, an overpowering stench hit me like a truck. The foul odor was so strong that it left a metallic aftertaste lingering in my mouth. Concerned by what it could be, I pulled out my pocket knife for protection and followed what felt like an invisible trail of nauseating fumes leading me away from the cabin. Much to my horror and dismay, just fifty yards from the safety of our dwelling stood a gruesome sight. A partially devoured deer carcass hung high up on a tree branch. Further examination revealed countless claw marks gashed into its hide and deep bite marks that seemed to chew right through the bones. The poor creature's insides were torn apart, leaving great gaping wounds from where its innards had been ripped out. The unsettling image before me suggested one thing, something sinister and monstrous lurked within the shadows of the woods. I decided to share my findings with my closest friend, Jake, a local outdoorsman who knew these forests better than anyone else. We agreed to keep watch at night and search for whatever was causing these grievous incidents. During one of our nightly vigils, we stumbled upon an old oak tree etched with cryptic markings and symbols previously concealed by thick foliage. It was apparent that whoever or whatever was orchestrating the bizarre events frequented this ominous spot. As Jake and I continued to observe the surroundings, my eyes caught a glimpse of an unnatural movement in the distance, a figure stalking us through the underbrush. It was human-like in appearance but much taller than any person I had ever seen, slender, scaly and covered in damp green scales that seemed to shimmer under the moonlight. Its eyes were large, black orbs seemingly devoid of emotion or soul, fixated on watching our every move. All I could do was choke down the bile rising in my throat as I realized what we were facing, an actual reptilian humanoid creature. Still maintaining eye contact with this terrifying predator, I discreetly retrieved my pocket knife and tossed it to Jake. There was no way we were going down without putting up a fight against this reptilian monstrosity. Our morbid fascination quickly deteriorated as panic set in. Claws gripped tightly onto tree bark as it made a sudden gut-wrenching screech that rattled our very cores. Jake and I turned on our heels. It was time to get out of there. Unfortunately for us, our enemy was faster than we anticipated. As adrenaline surged through our veins, we sprinted through the woods with the creature hot on our trail. The abhorrent hissing slithering behind us was proof of its relentless pursuit. It gained rapidly. Fear illuminated every fiber of my body. The chase continued, and I knew we had to think fast. I spotted a cabin in the distance, just barely visible through the trees. Though I wasn't sure of whose it was, it was our only chance at survival. I whispered to Jake, pointing toward the cabin and he nodded, understanding our precarious situation. We veered off, quickly approaching the refuge. As we slammed the door shut behind us, we could hear the vicious reptilian creature still pursuing us. Panting and out of breath, I scanned the room for a phone or radio to call for help. 
but there appeared to be none. Why is there no way to contact the outside world? I wondered aloud. Jade shrugged. What mattered now was fending off our nightmarish hunter. We frantically searched for anything that could be used as a weapon or defense mechanism against the beast. Our efforts were futile until we found a hatch leading to a basement that appeared fortified perhaps someone had dealt with this terror before. We climbed down and secured the entryway. The owner must have known about this creature. Jake suggested quietly as we listened intently for any sounds upstairs. We heard thumping and screeching as it tried to break into our sanctuary. It was only a matter of time before it found a way in. No one's coming to help us, Jake said grimly. We'll have to figure this out on our own. Suddenly, the screeching stopped altogether, replaced by an eerie silence that made my skin crawl. The anticipation became suffocating, until finally, unmistakable scraping noises drew closer from above. We braced ourselves for impact as the creature clawed its way in, tearing through wood as if it was paper, its dedication clearly undeterred by any barriers it encountered. Determination like that could only be fueled by insatiable hunger or an ingrained need for supremacy, a dominating rule over everything it crossed. The reptilian being made its way toward us, lumbering despite its speed, it lunged at Jake, who expertly dodged the attack while managing to land a blow to the creature's scaly side. The gash started oozing a putrid green liquid that resembled the scales covering its body. Perhaps some sense of mortality was finally settling upon the beast. As it turned its attention to me, I sidestepped just in time. Enraged by our evasions, the creature grew more relentless in its subsequent attacks, though never landing a successful strike. Jake and I continued to exchange defensive blows with the beast until, finally, it crumpled to the floor. A pain we slipped through its throat as it lay there spent. I think it's dying, Jake whispered cautiously. We kept our distance while watching it take its last breaths. Incredibly relieved yet filled with sorrow for whatever existence this grotesque creature had led before us. Seeing no other option, we decided to bury the creature deep within the woods, far from any path that we or others might cross by accident in future adventures. We promised never to mention this incident again. What good could come from the world knowing about such horrors? Days turned into weeks as we continued our lives, haunted by what had transpired. Those events weighed heavily upon us no matter how many failed attempts we made at forgetting them. The dreadful encounter forced Jake and me into a brotherly bond formed through shared terror and perseverance. A bond inexplicably solidified by our harrowing dance with death and survival. What had begun as an investigation into gruesome occurrences morphed into an airborne nightmare that seemed larger than life, a tale woven by fiction, or so some would say. If only they could have borne witness to our battle against that nightmarish entity, then those skeptics would come face to face with the same horrifying truth that we did. Not all creatures of this world are known. Some exist only to serve as haunting reminders of the depths at which life can adapt and endure, inexplicable monsters forged by the darkness and desperation that clings tightly to the underbelly of existence. It was July 2007 and I thought that taking up a truck driving job was the perfect way to make some decent money while seeing this beautiful country. I, Joe McGrath, never thought that my life would take a dark and twisted turn on an ordinary delivery run. But that's how it goes when you're living in this wicked game called life. My boss, Sammy Whitmore, had asked me to deliver a shipment of electronics to a place called Willow Creek 
a small town tucked away in the densely forested area of Montana. I had heard some folks mention it in passing, but this was going to be my first time there. After the company's customary routine of loading the truck and checking that everything was sound, I hopped into my 18-wheeler and embarked upon my journey. The dense trees surrounded the narrow road, forming a canopy overhead as I drove deeper into Montana. By the time I pulled over at the gas station for a refill, it had gotten dark. As I pumped gas into my truck, an old man hobbled towards me with his walking stick. Are you Joe McGrath? He asked nervously. Yeah, I replied, puzzled at how he knew my name. They told me you'd be making your usual stop here. He stammered while scratching his grizzled beard. I should tell you something before you move on. But before he could continue his tale, Sammy's voice suddenly came through on my CB radio. Joe, we've got some bad news. There's been an accident down the road from where you are. You'll need to take an alternate route. With urgency taking precedence over the old man's story, I offered my apologies and dashed back into the truck. I quickly plotted a new path through an isolated logging road to get around the accident. The gravel roads were slippery and treacherous, especially in the dead of night. As I was traversing the bedimmed path, suddenly, there was a loud thud that violently shook my truck from behind. Then, for a moment, it seemed as if some heavy chains were being dragged across the pavement outside. Panicked, I slammed my foot on the accelerator, desperately trying to see what had caused the rattling sound. The truck sped through the labyrinth in darkness, with the gut-wrenching noise fading into obscurity. As I reached Willow Creek to make my delivery, I noticed that everyone was oddly silent and guarded. Upon brandishing my delivery papers and asking about the commotion they experienced last night, their eyes widened operatically before shifting their gazes away like they'd seen a ghost. You might want to watch your back, whispered Sofia Alvarez, one of the townspeople. Terrible things have happened to other drivers on these lonely roads. I could tell there was much more to what she wanted to divulge about but she seemed terrified to utter another word. Immediately after finishing my delivery and getting back into my truck to leave town as quickly as possible, I looked at myself in the rearview mirror and mouthed a silent joke. Where did one ocean say to the other? Nothing. They just waved. It didn't make me smirk in even a small way. The logging woods appeared darker and more eerie than when I first came through them. Out of nowhere, this towering man came sprinting out from behind one of the great tree trunks. He had long limbs like tentacles and looked like he hadn't bathed or groomed himself in years. My mind raced as his figure darted towards my truck. Was this man responsible for all those tall tales about truck drivers meeting their ghastly fates on these quiet roads? Were the twisting creaks on his knuckles common knowledge? In a desperate attempt to evade the pursuing man, I took a sharp turn onto an overgrown path, hoping he would lose sight of my truck. The heavy foliage seemed to engulf my vehicle, creating a natural barrier between me and him. Yet, persistently, I could hear the sound of footsteps snapping twigs and rustling leaves behind me. Out of options and with no time to call for help, I skidded to a halt near a small clearing. As the man came into view once again, I locked my doors and frantically looked for something to use as a weapon if he decided to attack. The only thing within reach was a tire iron from under the passenger seat. It wasn't much, but it would have to do. The man approached my truck with unnerving speed. His tall stature cast an imposing silhouette against what little moonlight permeated through the trees. Though expecting aggressive intent, I was taken aback by his demeanor. It wasn't one of malice or rage. Instead, 
there was something desperate about him. He slammed his hands against the window with such force that I feared the glass would shatter. On closer inspection, while maintaining a safe distance behind my window, I eyed the chains wrapped around his body. It was obvious they restrained him and forced him into submission. With each movement he made in an attempt to free himself from these bonds drew an expression of agony. This horrendous display of torture left me paralyzed in both horror and pity. From what little I could make out from beneath layers of grime and unkempt hair on his face, this man used to have distinct features that were now lost due to years of torment. The rational part of my mind screamed for me not to engage in conversation with such a danger looming close by. Resisting any human instinct for compassion, I pressed down hard on the accelerator and tore away from the clearing where this tormented man remained, desperately trying to remove the chains that were digging deeper into his skin. Upon reaching the nearest town, I stopped at a local gas station to catch my breath and regain composure. Summoning the courage to break my silence, I hesitantly described the encounter to the store clerk, but instead of offering sympathy or concern, the man shook his head in pity. I wouldn't have believed it if you hadn't described him so accurately, the clerk said. My grandfather told me stories about a man who used to work for the logging company but was betrayed and brutalized by his co-workers. They chained him up and left him to die out in those woods. As I listened, my heart dropped into my stomach, realizing that whatever horrible act had been committed years ago now haunted those very logging roads and Willow Creek a wake-up call that some sins cannot be buried or forgotten. Before continuing on my journey, I looked back at Willow Creek one last time with a shudder. Sofia Alvarez's words echoing in my mind. Terrible things have happened to other drivers on these lonely roads. From that moment on, curiosity concerning the troubled souls of my past deliveries ceased entirely. I resolved never to return to those perilous roads again. The restless spirits dwelling there served as a stark reminder that certain evils should remain buried deep within history's darkest recesses. In memoriam of those doomed souls ensnared by these cruel acts, truckers like myself who never made it home, I carry their memory with me every time I sit behind the wheel. The tortured faces of previous victims may never truly leave me, their stories will now rest heavy on my conscience as I drive miles and miles away from this terrifying chapter of my life. It was the year 2021, and I found myself retreating to the secluded woods of northern Vermont in a small cabin far away from neighbors or cell service. My name's Theodore Finch, but most people just call me Theo. Living off the grid was just my cup of tea. It seemed like a perfect solution for someone who wanted peace, quiet, and occasional bouts of target shooting with my trusty Winchester. One particular evening, I set out for some firewood as I prepared for another cold night. I had a habit of cracking self-deprecating jokes, often merely for my own amusement. Ah, Theo. I mumbled with a slight smirk while chopping the wood. Must be great living like a lumberjack reject. Little did I know that this wouldn't be an ordinary night in my isolated paradise. As I trudged back to the cabin with arms full of wood, I noticed something strange at the fringe of my property an upturned earth that looked like recent digging. Curiosity piqued me. It wasn't every day you saw oddities in these parts. Making sure the wood stack could stay without toppling over onto me, I cautiously approached. Initially, it looked as if someone or something had hastily buried multiple bags in a shallow grave. The fresh soil stank of decay mixed with chemicals that were oddly reminiscent of embalming fluid. 
It was evident that someone or something had tried to hide this disturbing scene from prying eyes. Unnerved by this new development, and cracking another joke to alleviate my growing tension. Only thing missing here is the law and order theme. I prioritized alerting the authorities. However, with no cell service available and the nearest police station about 40 miles away through winding roads, a physical trip seemed inevitable. Reluctantly leaving the grim sight behind for now, I was barely inside my cabin when there came a forceful knock on my door. My visitor was a middle-aged, wiry man with bloodshot eyes, introducing himself as Randall from a few miles down the main trail. He mentioned that he couldn't help but notice the strange odor emanating from near my property and wanted to know if everything was all right. We stood in the doorway, exchanging words. Randall explained how he had heard rumors of an ominous creature roaming these woods at night, an animalistic beast whose appearance was as terrifying as its unfathomable hunger for human flesh. He spoke rapidly, seemingly paranoid about this unidentified menace. I tried to suppress my skepticism, but his claims seemed more like campfire stories than actual threats. Before I could invite him inside for a drink, an unearthly shriek pierced the air, sending shivers through my body despite the mild temperature. The sound was baffling, not quite animal or human, but undeniably full of agony and rage. Driven by instinct and adrenaline, we armed ourselves with whatever makeshift weapons we could find before venturing out into the ominous darkness to face the unknown menace. As Randall cautiously led the way through the thicket with his flashlight guiding us, we came upon grisly mangled woodland creatures in our path whose wounds bled fresh onto wet leaves beneath. As we continued toward the source of these macabre discoveries, our senses heightened and nerves fraying, we found ourselves ambushed by a monstrous shadow moving too fast for our human eyes. It encircled us as we frantically swung our weapons to keep it at bay. The beast launched forward, tearing into Randall's side and leaving deep gashes oozing with blood. The onyx creature towered above us both, its pallid skin barely concealing sinewy muscles that twitched in concerted effort. Rows of serrated teeth gnarled in malign grins as yellow eyes narrowed upon us. The vile stench of rotting flesh and stagnant blood saturated the air as pain began to overwhelm my senses. Determined to save Randall, I yelled, Let's get out of here! Our legs moved in tandem as we sprinted through the woods, trying to put distance between us and the monstrous creature. We stumbled upon an odd set of staircases that appeared to lead nowhere. I shouted to Randall, Climb one of the staircases. He cast a glance back at me and scrambled up the steps. I climbed another. The creature hesitated but continued to glare at us, its yellow eyes full of malevolence. It snarled and snapped its teeth but seemed unable to close in. Our cell phones had no reception in these dense woods, so we couldn't call for help. We decided to stay on the staircases, hoping they'd provide some protection against that horrific predator. Hours passed without any sign of that nightmarish beast reappearing. But every second of relative safety was overshadowed by the throbbing pain from Randall's wounds. Without medical assistance, Randall was growing weaker. I knew we had to reach help soon or I'd lose him. Growing increasingly desperate, we discussed attempting a mad dash towards civilization but were unsure about the distance or direction we needed to go. That's when we noticed a hiker passing by who overheard our distress. She expressed concern and offered help. We explained our encounter with a cryptid-like creature in the woods and asked if she knew anything about it or other strange occurrences nearby. The hiker, named Rosalind, revealed that she lived close by and had heard whispers about a cryptid called the Chiropteran beast inhabiting these parts of the forest. 
Rosalind beckoned us to follow her to her house nearby and said she could tend to Randall's injuries there. We descended the staircases cautiously and followed her through what seemed like an endless maze of trees before finally reaching her cottage nestled in a serene clearing. While Randall received much-needed care, Rosalind brought out books and maps that told stories about the vast forest inhabited by the Chiropteran beast. The creature, it seemed, hunting its prey in the dark hours of night, stalked silently and struck with lethal force. Realizing that we needed authorities to handle this dangerous threat, Rosalind called them using her landline phone. Soon a specialized team arrived at her cottage, equipped with weapons and gear to search the forest and neutralize whatever was lurking in the shadows. Randall provided a detailed description of the Chiropteran beast's appearance and the location where we encountered it. Injured but determined to see this through, he insisted on going back with the team to help locate and stop the creature before it could target any more innocent victims. The operation got underway in a heartbeat. The team scanned every corner of the woods under Randall's guidance. When they finally located and confronted the monstrous creature, it fought back vigorously till its final breath, a testament to its strength and resilience. With their objective accomplished, the team returned to Rosalind's cottage. Randall received praises for his courage and determination despite his injuries. They assured us that experts would assess any possible connections between the cryptid creature and those mysterious staircases in the woods. As our ordeal drew to an end, we were relieved that no one else would suffer from such a terrifying encounter. The memory of those mangled woodland creatures will be forever etched in our minds, as will be our gratitude towards Rosalind for saving our lives. Although our brush with death at the hands of a cryptid called Chiropteran Beast was not something we could have ever anticipated, we realized how fortunate we were to have survived such a malevolent entity lurking deep within nature's enigmatic shadows. My name's Travis Rollins, and I never thought I would end up in a situation like this in a million years. I was just an ordinary guy who snagged a job as a fire lookout in the Shenandoah National Park. It was June 2011, and my job was to spend my days keeping an eye out for wildfires and recording observations about the forest. I got along well with the other rangers and some volunteers who worked in the area. We'd amuse ourselves with some cringe-worthy wordplay, like, I would not want to leave this place, or, if it started raining logs, we'd really have logs to report. Yeah, not all of our jokes were great, but they helped break up the long days. It all started when a woman approached me one day while I was on duty with something strange she found in the forest. It appeared to be fragments of skin still attached to sharp claws almost like a unique creature had molted. Neither of us could recognize it. Without giving it much thought, we took pictures of the find and sent them over to core.infinity at safety.com, the email assigned for unknown findings while we resumed our everyday routines. What followed began with small incidents glimpses of odd-looking creatures quickly disappearing behind trees, high-pitched squeals often mistaken for foxes just as dawn broke. Each time something happened, we attempted calling for help, but we never seemed to get through on our radios. Still believing that everything had a logical explanation, we didn't dwell on it too much at first. Brian Owens, one of our volunteers from Baltimore who towered over six feet tall, began relaying strange dreams he had about impossibly contorted animals chasing him through the woods. While his nightmares amused some of us, others began whispering that they experienced eerily similar dreams. One afternoon in late June, 
as Brian and I made our way up to one of the watchtowers, a sound erupted just ahead of us. The noise like a choking gasp mixed with a horrid shriek froze us in place. Peering down the path, we spotted a bizarre creature with elongated limbs crawling out of the undergrowth. Its appearance shocked us, vaguely resembling what Brian described, and we realized this was our first visual encounter with whatever haunted us. Brian and I bolted in panic back to our co-workers. Breathless as we recounted our experience, many became convinced that the animal we stumbled upon was the same as depicted in the skin fragment incident. We collectively decided to seek help from wildlife expert Robert Helmsley who lived about 30 miles outside the park on his small farm. While on our way there, my mind raced and my nerves rattled at the prospect that maybe reality was matching my nightmares too closely. As our beat-up truck made its way through Windy Mountain Roads, Robert listened closely to our experiences. He remained curious but skeptical until we arrived at his cabin to show him the photographs we captured of those unearthly fragments with claws attached. When Robert saw the pictures, he paled a shade lighter visibly shaken breaching into a new level of insecurity that clung tight leaving us worried about what is to come next. His research yielded nothing about an endemic species that could provoke such gruesome findings. The only course of action he suggested was remaining vigilant ready for any progression this unknown creature incited to soothe its hunger. With Robert's recommendation echoing in our minds, none of us slept much that night expecting that something sinister awaited us in the darkness. July 1st marked a progressive change in the string of bizarre events when Chief Ranger Dan Thorne's lifeless body was discovered mutilated with unprecedented levels of violence trapping us in immense sorrow and paralyzing fear. One side of his face, it looked like, had been skinned. Everyone screamed in terror upon catching a glimpse of his gory, twisted form. We stood in dread, struggling to grasp the unimaginable. We mourned for our fallen friend but urgently realized how vulnerable we were to this sadistic creature, the one whose identity retained mystery as if preferring its anonymity when unleashing terror. But we couldn't escape. There was never enough time between continuous eerie incidents happening around us. The unknown creature's aggression grew more feverish each day as it stalked, terrified, and, as it had with Dan, tried to gruesomely capture all monitoring the national park. As the days went by, we decided to make a plan to protect ourselves from this relentless creature. We placed cameras and motion detectors around our camp, hoping to get a glimpse and possibly learn a way to dodge its gruesome attacks. One night, we heard screams coming from the south end of the campground. Petrified, I darted in the direction of the cries along with my fellow rangers, armed with only our flashlights and sheer desperation. The sight that greeted us made our knees buckle. Two more rangers lay on the ground eviscerated, every organ exposed as their lifeless eyes met ours. We backed away unable to process what we saw. For a split second, I thought I caught a glimpse of large hairy figure with menacing red eyes watching from the shadows. Our worst fear had come true. This creature was intent on picking us off one by one. Frenzied and desperate for help, we tried to call for backup but soon realized we had no signal due to our isolated location. The next morning, we held an emergency meeting to discuss how best to handle the situation. Without any viable information about this creature or possible defenses against it, our only option was to gather our remaining supplies and evacuate while we still had time. Early the following day, we loaded essential gear and provisions onto our truck. We hoped that somehow we would be able to understand what it was that hunted us and ensure no others would fall prey. 
Suddenly, agonized shrieks pierced through the air again, snapping us out of our hopeful thoughts. I ran toward the source, fearing another victim had been claimed but instead found Robert held firmly in the creature's clawed grasp. Only this time, I got a clearer image of it. A massive beast covered in matted fur towered over him with long pointed teeth dripping with blood. Its sharp claws were digging into Robert's flesh as vibrant red eyes glared back at me with malice. Panicked shouts and a nauseating crunch filled the air before the creature flung Robert's broken body to the ground. We watched in terror as the beast retreated into the darkness, indifferent to the chaos it left in its wake. After that encounter, with tears streaming down our faces, we screamed into the air one final time for all our fallen comrades lost to this monstrous predator. We had lost enough people, and it was time to leave before becoming victims ourselves. Our truck raced away from the park with heavy hearts and deep-rooted fear. The gruesome attacks and the brutal disfigurement of our fallen rangers forever imprinted on our minds. As we cleared the final exit of the forest, I swore never to set foot inside that place again, feeling deep within me that nothing humanity could do would stop this beast. Time passed since that horrifying experience, and now I sit here far away from those haunting woods, remembering my friends whose lives were brutally stolen by the Skinner. I can only pray that by sharing our story others will think twice before entering into its territory. Some may question if it was real or just a figment of our terrified minds wrought with paranoia. But as long as that place exists, and as long as tales of mutilated bodies surface from within that park, I know for certain that a monstrous unspeakable horror still lurks there, waiting for its next prey. I stepped into the narrow hallway of the small office, my boots clicking against the tiled floor. Morning, everyone. I'm Officer Royce Kaufman, I said with a slight grin, looking around at the curious faces of my new co-workers in our small-town precinct. I couldn't help but crack a joke to lighten the mood. It's so good to finally be working in a place where my horrible singing won't be heard by too many people. Laughter erupted in the room, and I instantly felt at ease. As the day progressed, I found myself settling into my new role rather quickly, until we received a call from dispatch about a distressing scene at an abandoned factory nearby Bristol, Tennessee. Royce, we need you and Officer Laura Stoke to check it out, Chief Jacobs instructed. Laura and I grabbed our gear and headed for our patrol car. Upon arriving at the factory, we cautiously crept inside, keeping our weapons at the ready. The rusty smell of decay and mold filled our lungs as we surveyed the area. We couldn't believe what we found in one of the darker corners, a body, twisted and mangled beyond recognition. Back at the precinct, we shared our findings with Chief Jacobs who immediately began organizing a search detail for more evidence. Our investigation led us deeper into the gruesome details of this case that had us chasing our tails for weeks. Each clue brought us closer to uncovering this mysterious figure responsible for a string of heinous attacks throughout town. We're gonna catch this guy. Laura insisted after another long day of questioning witnesses and analyzing evidence came up short. Someone like him can't keep living under everyone's radar forever. That night, as I sat contemplating Laura's words over a stale cinnamon bun from Jake's diner down the street, a restless feeling grew inside me. This person was out there somewhere, maybe even watching us, and that made it difficult for me to sleep. The next morning, exhausted from hours of tossing and turning, I received another call about a robbery gone wrong in the local library. Arriving on the scene, Laura and I noticed a trail of blood leading toward the back of the library. Curiosity peaked, 
we followed it until we stumbled upon a grisly scene in the basement. A familiar figure with dark hair and piercing eyes turned to face us. Officers, he smirked, holding a pistol to his side. His cold gaze seemed to pierce my soul. Looks like you've found me. Suddenly, Laura lunged towards him. As Laura lunged towards the dark-haired man with piercing eyes, I instinctively reached for my radio to call for backup. This is Officer Royce, requesting immediate backup at the library. Officer down an armed suspect. I relayed, keeping my tone steady despite the urgency of the situation. While waiting for reinforcements, I focused on keeping my eyes on the man now holding Laura captive. The man towered over her but was surprisingly lean, with a muscular build that indicated he was no stranger to physical activity. His scruffy facial hair set an eerie contrast against his pale, almost sickly-looking complexion, highlighting his large hooked nose and high cheekbones, a face that would be hauntingly unforgettable. By the time backup arrived, swift and focused, the entire library was cordoned off. Chief Jacobs took charge of the situation. He spoke through a megaphone, trying to negotiate with the armed suspect. Release Officer Stoke and drop your weapon. You're surrounded by highly trained officers who will not hesitate to bring you in by force if you don't comply. The criminal's eyes gleamed with amusement and defiance as his grip on Laura tightened. Noticing his demeanor grow more erratic with the seconds ticking by, I started forming a plan on how to save my partner. I won't go down easily, he shouted back at Chief Jacobs, waving his gun around erratically. Aware that time was of the essence and the situation could escalate in an instant, I nodded to Officer Thomas from across the room, a signal we had agreed upon earlier during our coordination for a risky and potentially dangerous maneuver should it come down to it. Mustering all their wit and precision, several officers deployed a synchronized diversion strategy using sound distraction devices. As chaos ensued, I gripped my weapon tightly in anticipation of its success. The moment our attacker got distracted and momentarily lost sight of me due to disorientation from noise and confusion, I sprang into action. I sprinted towards him, my aim focused on separating him from Laura and subduing him while minimizing the risk of injury to my partner. Each calculated step brought us closer to the resolution we desperately sought. I tackled the man, ensuring his gun was knocked out of harm's way. As we wrestled on the ground, he fought back with unexpected strength and agility. The struggle continued until reinforcements finally made their way over to help apprehend and cuff him. With the suspect in custody, I then checked on Laura, assessing her injuries and making sure she was all right. Miraculously, aside from a few scrapes and bruises, she seemed mostly unharmed. Still shaken from her ordeal, she gave me a grateful nod. As we left the library with our suspect in tow, Looking back at the gore-ridden basement that had almost become our grave only minutes ago was an eye-opener. Life as a police officer was always threatened by danger lurking in unexpected places. The following days were grim and exhausting, attending testimony meetings while trying to uncover more about our twisted criminal's history. It became clear that this man had been behind many of the gruesome crimes that had plagued our town for weeks. News of his arrest spread quickly through town, granting some relief after a long-fought battle for justice. We mourned the victims who had fallen prey to this monstrous figure, their lives cut short by cruelty, as they became gruesome reminders of what we were fighting against daily. Finally, with our efforts rewarded in the form of safe streets once more restored to Tennessee, we took a moment to appreciate our teamwork for managing such a high-stakes case with skillful efficiency. Our lives moved forward. Another day began. But the memories of that fateful night at the library would linger with us forever, a testament to our resolve as officers of law against evil lurking within the shadows of society.
As I stepped into the dimly lit room, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. My name is Leon Bracken, and I'm a Green Beret currently on a critical black ops mission in a remote village of Romania. The mission brief called it an information-gathering task, but there was more to it than just that. I leaned against the limestone walls, letting out a silent sigh. Proceeding ahead, a fellow operative named Gravis Greystone cracked a joke under his breath about how there's no Wi-Fi out here but we all knew the stakes were high. The tension grew thicker and heavier as we navigated through the narrow streets that seemed frozen in time. Our team was composed of highly skilled individuals, including our navigator Geneva Grayling, whose scarce childhood memories of this area played an essential role in our infiltration of the village. The air smelled of fresh rain mixed with the telltale scent of decay. It was then when we noticed droplets of blood gradually leading us to a gruesome sight, a mutilated body left for dead. After examining the horrific scene, it didn't make sense whatever did this to that man wasn't human. The wounds were too precise and massive for any known earthly being to inflict. It appeared that our mission suddenly morphed into something much darker. As we ventured deeper into the village, eerie silence engulfed us pierced only by our footsteps and faint whispers between team members. Suddenly, Gavro Varis, our muscle man with a talent for cracking codes, cracked another joke. Hey, guys, at least if we need organ donors later. We chuckled nervously under our breath while still on edge. Time passed agonizingly slow until we finally reached our destination an ancient stone fortress expected to contain information crucial for national security. Upon entering, we were met with a bone-chilling sight, walls lined with claw marks, thick with dried blood and scraps of unidentifiable flesh. The signs were clear. We weren't the first ones here. Tension mounted steadily as we explored the dark hallways of the fortress, shadows playing tricks on our nerves. Finally, the horrifying moment we'd been dreading came to life. A guttural growl erupted from the darkness ahead. My blood ran cold when a monstrous creature lunged towards us. Imagine the worst nightmare of medieval folklore mixed with modern terror. A hulking figure with acid yellow eyes and massive, gnarled teeth dripping with venom, long twisted claws extending from its scaly appendages like knives. As Gravis raised his gun in defense, the creature lunged at him with lightning speed, swiping away his weapon as if it were a mere toy. Panic and chaos took over as we retaliated with all our might, engaging furiously in a deadly struggle against this beast born from hell. The adrenaline coursing through my veins was palpable as we fought for survival, bullets flying and ricocheting off the creature's thick hide. It let out an unearthly roar that reverberated throughout the chamber a sound unlike anything I have ever experienced before. The creature's assault was relentless, mauling and incapacitating our teammates one by one. Each agonizing wound sent a sharp pain throughout my body, and I knew that I needed help. But it was too dangerous to attempt any calls for reinforcements. The risk of exposing ourselves even more to this ruthless beast was unbearable. As more and more body parts littered the floor, the last remaining members of our group scurried to locate a safe spot to hide. We found a small alcove barely large enough for several people, hoping it would provide some temporary sanctuary. While we hid, the creature continued on its rampage causing chaos and destruction in every shadowy corner of the ancient fortress. We dared not breathe, fearing even the slightest sound could lead it straight to us. Enter Samantha Hale, a formidable martial artist in our crew with deadly accuracy. As the creature neared our hiding spot, she studied it intently, assessing its movements and preparing her next course of action. In an instant she bolted from the alcove, her years of rigorous training finally coming into play as she silently launched herself towards the beast. The creature sensed her presence and spun around just in time to meet her mid-air assault. With a heart-stopping crunch, 
Samantha collided with the creature, sending both combatants tumbling backward. She fought valiantly against it, landing heavy punches that seemed only to anger it further. At that moment, Gravis had managed to recover his gun and started firing wildly at the beast. Distracted by Samantha's fierce attack combined with Gravis' desperate attempt at assistance, we watched as they cornered the vicious adversary. Their combined strength overpowered the monster as its once furious roar became pained whimpers. Moments later, silence filled the chamber. Gravis shot one last bullet straight through its skull and into oblivion. As we gathered around our fallen teammates, I couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of relief churning with mournful despair. The cost of obtaining the crucial information we were in search of had been paid with innocent lives. With our mission in tatters, we focused on evacuating the fortress and staying as far away from it as possible. The physical damage would heal eventually, but the psychological scars remained, a gruesome, vivid reminder of the horrors we had experienced. Once back at headquarters, officials investigated the creature that had blindsided us. Using remnants from its body, they determined it was an ancient, nearly extinct species known as the Grendel, an abomination from old Danish folklore. We couldn't believe it. A monster which should have been long dead was responsible for the sudden onslaught that took away our friends and colleagues. But just as legends have their roots in reality, so too did this tragic encounter. And although we'd never know why or how it ended up inside that deserted fortress, I made a silent vow to never forget those who lost their lives in that horrifying battle against an enemy no one realized still existed.